72 to 51%. This is an alarming erosion of trust in the integrity of a process that we hope and believe will produce an effective and safe vaccine in record time. Our goal in convening the symposium with our partners at the University of Washington is to shine a light on every facet of vaccine development to ensure that this process is guided by the most stringent principles of sound science and only sound science. Because we know that even the best vaccine is only effective if people trust it and ultimately agree to receive it. We are fortunate in this endeavor to have the leadership of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, including Dr. Chris Beyer and his colleagues across the Bloomberg School, at the Center for Immunization Research, the International Vaccine Access Center, the Center for Health Security, and the Johns Hopkins Vaccine Initiative scholars and scientists who are bringing their vast expertise to bear on this complex process. They, along with so many others joining us today, represent the very best of our great public and private research universities, institutions that have long borne the sacred responsibility of honing the scientific method, of advancing discovery across all fields of human knowledge, of safeguarding, protecting facts, for the public good and of creating opportunities for conversations such as this one in which critique is embraced in order to refine and strengthen ideas. We know, we know that science done right is important as science done quickly. These principles continue to define the indispensable role of universities in democratic society. The philosopher Hannah Arendt captured it so well in 1967 when she wrote, that the chances for truth to prevail in public are greatly improved by the mere existence of universities. And I couldn't ask for a better university to partner with in this undertaking than one of the country's truly great public institutions, the University of Washington, and its quite extraordinary leader, President Anna Marie Kause. President Kause, over to you. Thank you so much, President Daniels. I'm so honored to join you as well in this very, very important undertaking. The COVID-19 COVID pandemic has, prevented, has presented us with challenges unlike anything in our lifetimes. The stakes simply could not be higher. All over the planet, lives and livelihoods hang in the balance. We urgently need working vaccines for COVID-19. Just as importantly, we need public trust in the scientific process that produces those vaccines. Fostering trust in science is essential for the pandemic we face today and for those we may face tomorrow because COVID is not the last public health crisis that we will face. Trust in institutions and in each other is the bedrock of functioning democracies. And with today's proceedings, we seek to build and strengthen that sacred public trust. Research universities fill a unique and critical role in advancing knowledge and discovery for the betterment of humanity. We're dedicated to the pursuit of truth, and that requires devotion and strict adherence to the integrity of the scientific process. Universities are mission-driven. At the University of Washington, we define our mission as impact that serves the public good. This is a commitment and goal shared by our colleagues at John Hopkins and at universities and research institutes around the nation and world. The University of Washington and John Hopkins are both leaders in the fight against COVID-19. One from the public sector the other from the private, one from the East Coast, one on the West. And today we come together to stand arm in arm with the extraordinary teams and individuals leading the work to produce effective COVID-19 vaccines. And we're calling for preserving the sanctity of the science behind their work and for the scientific process to proceed at the speed of integrity and accuracy, not politics. 
Today, we're going to explore the complex issues that will bring that integrity and accuracy to the outcomes of this process. How to structure better clinical trials. How to ensure equity and diversity in recruitment into those trials. And to provide proper regulatory oversight. How do we make sure that the distribution of the vaccine is guided by ethics and equity? How do we communicate clearly to a broad array of audiences? We're asking everyone, policymakers, scientists, pharmaceutical companies, the media, technology companies, and the public to unite around a common goal, the creation of working vaccines that have earned the trust of the public. And now it is such a pleasure to introduce someone who's earned the public's trust with his unflagging commitment to truth and public education. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health. He's become a household name as the voice of reason and authority in our national effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. As a scientist, he's devoted his long and distinguished career to learning, discovery, and truth. As a public servant, he serves not just our nation, but all of humanity. He's probably done as much as any other individual to maintain the public trust in science. And we are so honored to have him as our first keynote speaker. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anthony Fauci. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present in a brief presentation in this session on the science and structure of the United States government COVID-19 vaccine trial program. As shown on this slide, I'm going to talk about the overall structure of the U.S. COVID vaccine program, but I'm going to focus a bit more on the NIH role, given my perspective as an NIH person. I'm going to divide this into four separate brief presentations. The first regarding the U.S. government's vaccine development stakeholders. Very briefly, who are they or who are we and what do we do? As shown here of the different stakeholders, the NIH, particularly NIAID, the institute that I direct, we do basic and clinical research on vaccine candidates. Our close colleague in this is the Department of Defense, who also does basic and clinical research on various vaccine candidates, as well as some limited manufacturing and advanced development specifically designed for their war fighters. ASPR, as well as BARDA, which is a part of ASPR, are involved in advanced clinical development and manufacturing support via a variety of contracts, and ASPR does oversee the strategic national stockpile. The FDA, the primary regulatory agency, advises on data requirements for each stage of vaccine development, as well as reviewing the preclinical and clinical data packages for potential authorization or licensure. And finally, the CDC, who via Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, recommends who is vaccinated, when, and with what vaccine, as well as shaping the prioritization for immunization when quantities are scarce. This is the pre-COVID-19 U.S. government vaccine development model, which we have actually employed and adapted for what we are currently doing today. As you can see, most of the early concept and product development resides with the NIH, who together with BARDA is involved in the advanced development, which is the major uh, mandate of BARDA, together with the commercial manufacturing capability of industry. So BARDA involved with industry is very, very important, as well as then the final regulatory review of FDA. But please note on the slide that industry, as well as FDA, get involved in the process right from the very beginning as manifested by the NIH's role in collaborating literally within the first days of the COVID-19 outbreak with industry. And the FDA now and the model that they employ today is very much involved in consultation with us, with not only the NIH, but with BARDA and the industry right from the very beginning of the process. And this process indeed has worked very well. Then there's Operation Warp Speed, which is the overall coordinator of the effort, 
led by Monsef Slawi, who you'll hear about shortly, as well as General Gustav Perna. I'll lead the discussion of Operation Warp Speed to Monsef Slawi, who I believe will follow me shortly. Going to the second major group is the basic research. Let's talk about the novel platform technologies that have actually now been employed. This is particularly important because several of these do have this platform technology, such as the mRNA that we've seen in at least two of the vaccines, the viral vectors, the recombinant proteins, the adjuvants that are involved with the recombinant proteins, the virus-like particles and nanoparticles, which will likely be used in other vaccines. Then you go to image and design. This is something that really dates back to the work that has been done with HIV vaccine and immunogen design, structural biology using a variety of modern techniques such as cryo-EM has allowed us to very, very carefully and specifically delineate the conformational structure of the spike protein, which is very important in the development. This is a slide shown in mares vaccine that was used, but we have now extrapolated that to the, the uh, current uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And then there's clinical research. We have networks in clinical research that we have actually built decades ago associated with our work on HIV AIDS. This is a timeline from the very beginning of the HIV AIDS outbreak from 1983, when we put together the treatment uh, evaluation units, the original ACTEUs, which ultimately became the group called ACTG. Then there was the prevention trials network and the vaccine trials network. All of these now are playing a major role in our attempts to develop therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19. Then there's the issue of can you do clinical research in an outbreak setting? This is some of the history of how we've evolved to where we are today. When research was done with the H1N1 vaccine trials of the pandemic of 2009, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the Zika outbreak in South America, Ebola again in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and then the SARS coronavirus 2, which is overseen now by Operation Warp Speed vaccine trials. So we have a clinical research apparatus that has performed scientifically sound and ethically sound research in the context of an ongoing outbreak. And in fact, the National Academy of Medicine did a post-Ebola study and wrote a report in April of 2017, which emphasized that the core principles of science and ethics in conducting clinical research does not change when that research is conducted in the context of an ongoing outbreak. And the randomized clinical trial are ethical and appropriate and are the most efficient and reliable way to determine safety and efficacy. Let's move on to community engagement, something that I have now had decades of experience in, as shown by this interesting historical slide. It goes back 32 years in the beginning of the outbreak where the community felt they were not adequately represented in the discussions of the kinds of clinical trials that could be done. And this was an eye opener for me. It was an article that appeared on the front page of the San Francisco Examiner in June of 1988 by my now uh, years later, who became a dear friend who unfortunately has recently passed, namely Larry Kramer. As you can see, the title is, I Call You Murderers, an open letter to an incompetent idiot, Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institute of allergy and infectious diseases. That was 32 years ago. He wanted to catch our attention. He and the activists, namely ACT UP, felt that we were not doing enough. We were not paying attention to their needs. We did not engage them well. Here's an example of a, of a demonstration, as you can see from the signs. And remember, Ronald Reagan was president at the time. Again, they felt we were not engaging them properly. This is a Academy Award nominated film, How to Survive a Plague, which was talking about the evolution of the then to become successful community engagement. The person on the slide is a young man, then now my colleague and very dear friend, Peter Staley, who has emerged from an adversary to now one of my close personal friends. 
Well, I'm telling you this story because what this led to was our developing community programs for clinical research on AIDS, as well as community advisory boards on virtually everything we did. We firmly engaged the community. That is trying to be done now with the SEAL program, the Community Engagement Alliance team, which is a pan-NIH entity, which leverages our long-standing clinical trial network engagement that I have mentioned to you just a moment ago, as well as the CoPN Community Engagement Working Group, which is working on that well-established community engagement program. And finally, the COVID-19 clinical trial approach. This is a list very familiar to you now of the multiple platforms, the multiple companies, and the various stages of clinical trial, with five of these now engaged in either phase two or mostly phase three trials. We have put together what I call a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine development with harmonization of the multiple trials with common data and safety monitoring board, common to the extent possible primary and secondary endpoints, as well as common immunological parameters that are used for correlates of immunity. This is a map picture of the location of the NIAID COVID-19 prevention network, which is now being actively used in the prevention trials that we are now implementing. And finally, I'll close with this last slide, which if anyone has any interest in looking after and looking out to see what the prevention capabilities are, what the trials are, and importantly, if you actually want to uh, volunteer or at least be considered as a volunteer for one of these prevention trials, particularly vaccine. So I'll close there and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. To introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mansub Slawi, who is currently serving as Chief Advisor for the United States Government's Coronavirus Vaccine Development Program, Operation Warp Speed. Dr. Slawi has devoted his life to vaccines, which, as he has often noted, stand among the most effective public health interventions in existence. From his days as a professor at the University of Mons in Belgium to his position as Chairman of Research and Development and Global Vaccines at GlaxoSmithKline, where we oversaw the work of thousands of research scientists to navigating in this moment, one of the most difficult and scrutinized jobs in the world in search of a COVID vaccine. Dr. Slawi has been unequivocal in his desire to save lives through vaccination, but always steered by scientific fact. We thank Dr. Slawi for taking the time to join us today. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President Daniels. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, very, very nice to talk to you today. Thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm going to try to be very brief and describe to you what Operation Warp Speed is, uh, how we're organized and how we go about uh, supporting development of vaccines and therapeutics. I'm going to focus on vaccines today. I'll try to do this in 10 or 15 minutes maximum. The operation is a, a team with a mission, a mission to integrate the great work from various agencies in human and health services, such as the NIH, NIAID, such as the CDC, such as BARDA, ASPR, and also agencies from the Department of Defense, in particular DARPA, or the logistics organization and a contracting organization, and really the might of the US Army in terms of, of infrastructure and logistics. Integrating these capabilities and capacities that are within the US government with those of the private sector, particularly from those companies, biotech or large pharmaceutical or medium pharmaceutical companies, that uh, the, the programs of which we have selected either vaccines or therapeutics, and also with the work of academic centers, and in particular, the COVPN network that are a critical part in the uh, execution and running and design of the clinical trials uh, uh, for, the, for the vaccines in question. The, there is a very small leadership team, and we have dedicated project team for each one of the programs that we have in the portfolio. Our role is to select programs, and once we've selected them, to enable them, finance them, advise them, you know, facilitate, accelerate them, because our mission is to deliver approved vaccines to the American people 
before the end of the year uh, and in enough quantities so as to immunize the US population potentially by the middle of 2021 or slightly later. Uh, we elected in order to manage the risk and at the same time provide us with opportunities to have different vaccines with different product profiles for different subpopulation uh, uh, targets. We elected to build a portfolio of programs based on the selection of four platform technologies for vaccines. And we selected these platform on the basis, on our judgment, for the best balance between speed of development, likelihood of efficacy, expected safety profile, scale up and industrial manufacturability, and also capacity of their private owners, the companies that we sponsor, uh, to execute uh, because the operation is not the executor, it's really the enabler for the executors. Uh, we've selected, as I said, four platform technologies and we elected to have two vaccine candidates within each platform technologies, again, to hedge our bets. Of these, six are public. Two are based on messenger RNA, the uh, vaccine from Moderna and a vaccine from uh, Pfizer. These two vaccines are now in phase three trials. They have almost completed their recruitment, 30,000 subjects for Moderna and about 45,000 for Pfizer. And we expect them to read out or have a first look at their efficacy outcome within the next seven weeks. Nobody can really say when, but the expectation would be that this could happen between the month of November and December. The second platform technology we selected are uh, non-replicating live vector vaccine. These are either chimpanzee adenovirus uh, used by the AstraZeneca and Oxford University vaccine or human adenovirus 26 used by Janssen's j, &J. These two vaccines are also in phase three trials, uh, less advanced in terms of recruitment than the first two vaccines. Uh, and one of them, the AstraZeneca vaccine is on hold at the FDA. It was also put on hold uh, in other countries where it's running phase three trials, the UK, Brazil, South Africa, Japan. But those holds have been lifted. Uh, the lift has not yet taken place in uh, the US. Uh, because their recruitment is at an earlier stage, the expected earliest readout for efficacy of these vaccine trials uh, is somewhere in the beginning of 2021, probably January. And then the third platform technology are adjuvanted protein, recombinant protein uh, vaccines, a vaccine from Novavax and a vaccine from Sanofi and GSK in partnership. These vaccines are in phase one and phase two trials, and they are expected to start their phase three trials probably by late November. And again, because of that later uh, start, they will expect to have their phase three readout on efficacy somewhere towards the end of the first quarter of 2021, March uh, or something like that. Supporting these, sorry, and then, then there are fourth, uh, a fourth platform that we haven't named uh, what vaccines are in it, uh, but it's a platform for live replicating vector vaccines that have the potential to be either a one dose vaccine or an oral vaccine. Those are not yet uh, effectively in the clinic and are unlikely to achieve clinical efficacy prior to the middle of 2021. To support these programs into preclinical and then early clinical and then phase three trials has been a moment, monumental effort by all players, the companies, the operation, the various agencies, the academics uh, and the COVID-PN network. And I should say we're reasonably pleased with the progress. It's been uh, really fast and we expect uh, to have three waves of efficacy readouts over the next several months. First wave with the RNA vaccines, uh, imminently November, December, a second wave with the non-replicating vectors vaccine in uh, January or February, and then a third wave with the protein adjuvanted in March, April. That's great and excellent. And everybody actually expect then that uh, filing for an emergency use authorization or BLA would take place. But that of course is only half of the story. The other half equally important and frankly, even more complicated to deliver is to scale up and to industrially manufacture these vaccines producing a few hundred doses, a few thousands or tens of thousands of doses per batch of vaccine is one thing. 
producing millions or tens or hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine, where you make sure that the first dose and the 100 or 500 million dose of vaccine is the same, consistently the same, is a very different story. We have invested enormous efforts and finance and technology in uh, supporting the companies directly and in fact much more closely to scale up and manufacture the vaccine doses and do it in a way and at a pace that allows the vaccine manufacturing speed to match that of the clinical development because it's obviously useless to have lots of vaccine doses and no clinical efficacy and even more dramatic to announce great success for clinical efficacy and have no vaccine doses to immunize and respond to the uh, expectations of the population. So an update on that for the messenger RNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna. This is a completely novel technology, very little experience with it and with scaling it up. However, fortunately, it's a semi-chemical process, much less complex than the biological uh, processes. I don't want to downplay it, super complicated, but less complicated and more predictable. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that thanks to the enormous focus and efforts that both companies have put behind this and the support that we provided them in every possible dimension from uh, providing you know, government uh, dictate, I would say, on uh, uh, supply of raw materials and equipments to hiring of people, to training, to et cetera, uh, they have now both been able to achieve industrial scale manufacturing of the vaccine. We are in the process of stockpiling vaccine doses in the single digit million doses in the months of October and November and then in the tens of millions of doses in November and in uh, the month of uh, January onwards, we have 20 and 30 million doses of each one of these vaccines uh, manufactured uh, at scale. The second uh, family of uh, vaccines, as I said, are the non-replicated vector vaccine from AstraZeneca and J&J. &J. The AstraZeneca vaccine process is, uh, has actually now been scaled up at, uh, at uh, industrial scale, about 2,000 meter. Uh, the challenge we have, frankly, is that while the clinical trials in the US are early, the phase three trial is in hold, as I said earlier, there are phase three trials ongoing in uh, the UK, Brazil, and South Africa. And those trials may deliver their readout or first readout on efficacy somewhere in late October or November. And uh, at that time, we will have very few doses of vaccine uh, to, uh, to be able to, if uh, a decision was to uh, approve them, to approve that particular vaccine, we have very few doses to immunize. We're working very hard to accelerate the manufacturing and stockpiling of this vaccine. We will start to have a few tens of millions of doses as of January onwards. And there have been significant changes in the scale of process to the way the vaccine is manufactured. So we may have to do some clinical bridging between the early vaccine doses that were used in the early clinical studies and the, uh, and the stockpile vaccine. The J&J &J vaccine process manufacturing is progressing pretty well. It's about six or eight weeks behind that of AstraZeneca. Both of these vaccines are being manufactured uh, at a uh, contract manufactured for manufacturing company called um, emergent uh, and uh, based in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. Uh, we have worked very hard to equip that company to um, uh, source it with talent, uh, train them, uh, raw material, uh, the whole, the whole uh, good progress, but very hard work. The protein vaccine uh, are the most complex to scale up. Uh, we have to produce the protein and uh, have an integral three-dimensional structure. Uh, one of the proteins have its transmembrane region and therefore is much more difficult to separate from any other proteins in the milieu. Uh, however, because their time frame for clinical efficacy is somewhere in the first quarter for this uh, vaccine, we will actually have vaccine doses available prior to the expected availability of efficacy trial. We'll start to stockpile these vaccines in January. They're being produced in manufacturing facilities in uh, North Carolina and Texas for Novavax and in Massachusetts and uh, uh, New Jersey uh, for, uh, for uh, the Sanofi vaccine. All in all, we have actually created a network of 25 manufacturing sites across the US, all of them in the US, 
about half are involved in the what's called the drug substance manufacturing or the bulk manufacturing, so the fermentation, making the protein or the virus or the RNA. And the other half is uh, involved in what's called the drug product manufacturing, which is the sterile fill finish uh, in vials uh, of the vaccines that needs to have an imagine 300 million doses is not something that you can vial very quickly in a sterile uh, environment. Um, uh, this, this, this network is working very, very well, and you know, we're very, uh, very happy with it. The one learning message that we came to uh, as part of this process was to recommend to the companies that we are supporting that if they achieve efficacy demonstration, while there are no vaccine doses available at industrial scale to at, at several million doses, to be able to immunize at least a relevant fraction of the population that they should re refrain or at least consider refraining from filing for an EUA because you know, our population would, would, would have major disappointment uh, on the expectation for availability of the vaccine. Finally, just a few words to say the operation is also involved with the distribution uh, of the vaccines and uh, in, in a way uh, in the allocation uh, of the vaccine doses. We very early uh, worked with the NIH and Dr. Francis Collins to uh, identify the best possible party that can help us with a science-based, ethic-based, data-based uh, assessment of how best to allocate vaccines in the setting of the epidemic. The National Academy of Medicine uh, was identified and did a, a tremendous great job uh, that uh, was just published last week. And I was very interested and pleased to see, for instance, that in their three phases of recommended immunization in a stepwise way, the, the first two populations represent about 80 to 90 million subjects in the USA that can be subdivided in two subgroups, one of 30 some million and one of 50 some million subjects. The reason I say that is we feel comfortable that within the next month, month and a half, two months, we will have one or two vaccines, the RNA vaccines, that will read efficacy and for which we will have enough vaccine doses as of November, December to immunize with two doses, 30 million subjects first, and then in December, January, uh, immunize 50 million individuals and start to significantly impact this pandemic into the country. And then things will continue uh, afterwards. I'm amazed actually to just take a step back and realize that the sequence of this virus was described on January 23rd, 2020, which is less than 10 months ago. And we're sitting here talking about programs in phase three trials in industrial manufacturing. And probably by the time, uh, well before the time one year has gone by, we are likely to have effective, safe, and largely available in doses vaccine. I think that really speaks to the enormous commitment that all the players have had behind this uh, crisis on the one hand, but also to the great advance of science and technologies that underpin vaccine design and development, whether in academic setting or industry. Thank you. Well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Slawi. This is so incredibly exciting and promising. Um, the effort that you're leading in Operation Warp Speed is of critical importance not only to the people of our nation, but as you have so aptly said, to the whole world. Um, we join you in believing that science's highest calling is to advance the public good. And as Dr. Slawi has noted, it is paramount for the safety of millions that the vaccine trial process be allowed to proceed with all the appropriate procedures, reviews, and oversights, even within the context of an accelerated process. Those checks aren't just critical to the development of a safe and effective vaccine, although they are, they're also essential to maintaining and inspiring the public trust. And I so much applaud, applaud you, Dr. Slawi, for your unequivocal pledge to resign rather than to tolerate political interference in this development process. That is so incredibly admirable. Thank you. The absolute necessity of a vaccine process endowed with scientific integrity 
is at the very heart of our mission. And it's why President Daniels and I have joined together to host this very important series of conversations. It's such a pleasure to be working with you, President Daniels, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Kase and all our colleagues at the University of Washington for your partnership and leadership in convening this important conversation. I'm grateful to our speakers for their time and for sharing their insight into our collective efforts to find a vaccine at this critical juncture in human history. And it truly is historic. Yet, as Dr. Fauci said, our current search for a vaccine is and must be built on a firm foundation of efforts that have established efficient, effective, and ethically sound approaches to such development. In a pandemic such as this one, we cannot abide abandoning such a process, but must double and redouble our efforts to adhere to them ever more sedulously. We only have to look at global efforts to combat Zika and Ebola to see that the evidence supports the system's past successes. And we can trust that evidence, that evidence when it is validated and then delivered by someone like Dr. Fauci, who has quite literally been in the room where these developments have happened for nearly four decades. It's an extraordinary career. We are delighted to have the chance to hear uh, this afternoon from leaders of our present effort, Thank you again to all our speakers and Dr. Kause. Now, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Chris Byer, Desmond M. Tutu, Professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Senior Scientific Liaison to the COVID-19 Vaccine Prevention Network, and I might say, a close friend. Chris, over to you. Well, thank you so much, President Daniels. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to everybody, uh, to all the attendees of today's symposium on protecting the integrity of the COVID vaccine development effort. As you've heard from Dr. Slowey, this is truly an unprecedented undertaking. Uh, we, um, as Dr. Daniels uh, kindly noted, I'm serving as your moderator for the four panel sessions that are to come. Uh, each panel, we've tried to bring together uh, really authoritative voices to discuss and debate the critical aspects of vaccine trial uh, outcomes and vaccine trial integrity. The first is going to focus on the conduct of the efficacy trials themselves uh, and the critical importance both of having multiple trials and of diversity and inclusion in those trials. The second will address the issue of regulatory integrity with a particular focus on the FDA uh, and the issue of potential emergency use authorizations that Monsef uh, spoke to for the COVID candidate vaccines. And many of you will know that this is in the news yesterday and today uh, with the FDA reasserting that it is going to maintain uh, the highest standards uh, for these EUAs. The third will address integrity in communications uh, and feature science reporters who are covering the trials and the pandemic and the last will address uh, the most important issues likely facing us if and when we do have safe and effective COVID vaccines, the issues of allocation, access, and equity. After these sessions, uh, Dr. Ellen McKenzie, the Dean of our School of Public Health, and Francis Collins, the Director of the NIH, will close out our programming. So let me then introduce the first panel of the afternoon, Protecting Scientific Integrity in the Design and Conduct of the Trials. This session is going to be co-chaired by Ruth Karen, Director of the Center for Immunization Research at Hopkins, and Dr. Keith Jerome, who's Professor and Head of the Virology Division at the University of Washington Medical School. So keeping our theme of Hopkins and Washington. We'll begin with a keynote by Professor Larry Corey, who is the co-chair of the COVID Vaccine Prevention Network, the CoVPN, and Professor of Medicine and Laboratory Medicine at UW. And then Larry will be joined on the panel, he'll join the panel, and the panel will include Dr. Michelle Andrasik, who is leading community engagement for the CoVPN, and they will be joined by Dr. Joseph Millam, who is a bioethicist at the Clinical Center, the Fogarty Center of the NIH. So Ruth and Keith, over to you. Thank you so much, Chris, and welcome to session two. I'm Ruth Karen, and as Chris mentioned, I'll be chairing, co-chairing this session with my colleague, Dr. Keith Jerome. Here we'll discuss how the design, execution, and analysis 
of ongoing and planned COVID-19 vaccine trials will provide robust data for decision-making about vaccine authorization, licensure, and use. Safeguarding and promoting the integrity of trial conduct not only ensures the integrity of the data, but lays the foundation for building public trust and confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. I'll now turn over to Dr. Jerome for introduction of our keynote speaker. Thank you, Ruth. It's a great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Larry Corey. Larry is a world-renowned virologist who has really made fundamental contributions to the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of viral infections. Larry led the very earliest clinical studies in the use of acyclovir for herpes infections, which really opened the modern era of antiviral therapy. He extended this into HIV studies um, and is now leading through the HIV vaccine trials network the effort uh, to develop a vaccine to address the global AIDS pandemic. We're very fortunate to have Larry and his expertise centrally involved uh, in the effort toward a vaccine against COVID-19. So Larry, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris and uh, Dr. Karen and, Jer and Jerome. Uh, I'd like to turn to the slides if I could. Um, my talk will provide an overview of the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials program associated with Operation Warp Speed and discuss some of the upcoming implications and issues associated with these clinical trials. One cannot give a talk about such an extensive program without the enormous cooperation of a large number of people, some of whom are listed here. Key members of Operation Warp Speed who I get to work with, my colleagues in the NIH supported COVID-19 prevention network, a special thanks to the Active Vaccine Working Group led by Doug Lowey and Katherine Johnson and to the various subcommittee chairs. This group of experts who donate their time and energy to the vaccine program have been instrumental in many ways, including advocating for the transparent publications of the protocols online. Next slide. As Tony Amonsef outlined, the Operation Warp Speed program supports five major platform technologies that are selected for their past track record in supporting effective vaccines. OWS and NIH are working in concert with the major pharmaceutical companies who provide their expertise and experience in vaccine manufacturing to scale to the hundreds of millions of doses required to rapidly deploy immunization to the U.S. population of 330 million people and a global population of over 4.4 billion adults and 3 billion children. No single technology possesses the manufacturing infrastructure to be a sole source of a vaccine to our country, let alone globally. In addition, the platforms possess varying side effect profiles. They have differences in their stability and cold chain control, as well as experience in select populations such as children or pregnant women and the elderly. Hence the programmatic desire that multiple vaccines meet efficacy standards. As the portfolio has been described well by Monsef, I will move to a description of the clinical trials program uh, of which I am involved. Next slide. One of the early challenges of the program was to develop a strategy to evaluate each vaccine on a level playing field, recognizing that the different manufacturing procedures and timelines for each technology could not be coordinated around a uniform start date. Next slide. We outlined a program in which we could conduct individual but harmonized clinical trials with common efficacy evaluations and standardization of the key elements of each protocol. The individual efficacy trials would be large, 30,000 persons per trial, essentially double the size that we would normally use in order to increase the safety profile as well as improve the speed to developing a timeline. The trials would involve an NIH supported clinical trials network whose experience in recruiting populations with health disparities was built into the program. Common laboratories and procedures are used for documenting COVID endpoints as well as assessing the immunological assays post-vaccination. A cross-protocol and within-protocol evaluation for correlates of protection is embedded into each trial. All the vaccines are using the spike protein, and one hopes it is to find an antibody response about which protection is achieved, above which protection is achieved. Such a finding would rapidly speed vaccine testing in groups that are not in clinical trials, such as children and pregnant women. Moreover, if two different vaccines given a similar antibody correlate, then it becomes a more of a mechanistic correlate, and one can actually speed studies globally and speed next generation vaccines. Importantly, was the empowerment of a common data safety monitoring board to review the trials in con the context of each other. 
Next slide. The next slide shows the diversity in immune responses to the spike protein between the platforms. This slide outlines the data from initial phase one trials in adults 18 to 55 in the four current in four of the uh, trials or four of the platforms for which it's available. You will note that both binding antibodies and neutralizing antibodies differ substantially in the initial phase one trials among the four platforms outlined in the slide. I'm not commenting how this translates into vaccine efficacy. That's why we do clinical trials. The slide is to show that there is immunological diversity between the platforms and hence a scientific rationale why each vaccine needs to be evaluated for its safety and its efficacy. Next slide. The next slide shows the unprecedented pace of the program. One 30,000 person efficacy trials per month in this country from July to December 2020. These next months will have three simultaneous 30,000 person trials underway. The next slide. The main goal of each of the tr clinical trials is to evaluate each candidate vaccine with high veracity for their safety and their potential efficacy in reducing COVID-19 disease. Each trial randomizes 30,000 people, either two to one or one to one between vaccine and placebo. Careful attention has been given to making sure populations most affected by the epidemic in our country, black, Latinx, and tribal communities participate in the trial. Doctors Collins, Fauci, Dave Wilson, the director of the Tribal Health Research Office at the NIH, Dr. Gary Gibbons from the National Health uh, Lung uh, Blood Institute, and my colleague Nelson Michael have been immensely helpful in this arena. This issue will be discussed on the upcoming panel by Dr. Andrasik, head of the Community Engagement Program in the COVPN. It's imperative that we evaluate the effectiveness of the vaccine in the epidemiological setting of the people at greatest risk, who because of their work, and their economic disparities are exposed to the virus both more frequently and what appears to be at higher titer. This is an ongoing and continued priority of the program. Next slide. A schematic of the spectrum of COVID-19 infection is outlined in this slide. In its most basic form, COVID-19 can be split into symptomatic and asymptomatic infections at the top of the slide. All the vaccine studies are devoted to determining if the vaccine reduced the severity of co symptomatic COVID infection, the 60 to 80% of SARS-CoV-2 that is symptomatic. Symptomatic disease can be split into severe or non-severe disease. Severe disease is essentially hospitalization, hopefully not on an ICU or ventilator or death. Non-severe disease at its simplest form is persons not requiring hospitalization. But we all know the substantial morbidity of this Ill illness in non-hospitalized persons, as there is substantial pressure to take only the sickest to hospitals. Thus, defining medically complicated COVID-19 persons, uh, what I've shown at the bottom, who have sought out medical care for sustained fever, shortness of breath, continued severe cough, neurological symptoms or signs, and hypoxemia are collected on the trial. Now, what percent of medically complicated cases will we see in our vaccine studies is at the moment unclear. We know the disease severity is influenced by age, by race, by intensity of exposure, and medical comorbidities. Evidence that a COVID-19 vaccine could reduce the risk of hypoxemia and hospitalization and ICU care is an important, if not imperative, factor in defining the vaccine's medical utility. The important part of this slide is in the red circle, which shows that we expect about 27 to 30 cases of medically complicated COVID-19 in a fully enrolled trial. If the trial is analyzed early, for example, with there are only 50 endpoints, rather than 150 as illustrated here, there will be only nine to 10 such cases, making true assessment of vaccine efficacy in this important area, skimpy at best. Next slide. One of the critical elements in this symposium is the issue of whether early peaks of the data should be used to seek an uh, a, uh, emergency youth authorization for widespread vaccine distribution. Most of the companies have been seeking an early look for a potential EUA at about one third through the trial at 60 to 70 case time. The elephant in the room in the halls of academia and Congress and yesterday's New York Times is to see if widespread use should emanate from this early look. Would such an early look provide enough data to initiate vaccinating 90 million elderly people, as Monsef um, uh, earlier alluded to? 
For those of you greater than 65 who have medical comorbidities, want vaccination and an approval of nine cases, even if it was a 60, six to three or even a seven to two split. Next slide. The next slide illustrates the poignancy of this issue. This slide illustrates the time course of accruing symptomatic COVID over the time of one of the vaccine trials. The x-axis is weeks post initiating the trial. The y-axis is the estimated accrual of cases based upon ongoing modeling and experimental data. One reaches 50 infections in a vaccine regimen with two doses separated by three weeks at around 16 weeks post initiating the trial based on our projections uh, of, of COVID-19 acquisition in the United States. What is important is the slope of the line. Because of the large trial, it takes only four more weeks to double the information to 100 accrued cases, and only three weeks more after that to triple the information and achieve the fully mature 150 case endpoints that sets off the primary efficacy analysis of each individual trial. By keeping a trial blinded and open seven additional weeks, one triples the amount one can learn about vaccine efficacy. Allowing the trial to be designed to its designed end would provide high likelihood that we would be able to determine the vaccine efficacy appears to benefit the elderly, those with health disparities, and importantly, reduce medical complications. The next slide just verbally puts on the slide the issues that I outlined in the graph. Next slide. Besides the implications to the trial involving the vaccine being evaluated from the EUA, there are of course implications for all the other ongoing trials. For better or worse, the OWS program is the main platform for evaluation of these COVID-19 vaccines globally. While COVID-19 vaccine studies are being conducted in areas outside these, the US, these trials are only two to 4,000 persons, sometimes 5,000, and not of the robust safety magnitude of our US-based trials. Next slide. The next slide outlines in a graphic fashion the timelines of initiation and expected time to reaching the endpoints in other OWS trials. This is my modeling. They are imputed assumptions all based upon infection rates many months from now, similar to what we have now. The slide shows that any EUA in 2020 is likely to affect the conduct of these protein-based vaccines by Novavax and Sanofi. Initiating comparative trials comparing these vaccines to the RNA vaccines is one approach that arises if this occurs, i.e. our inability to conduct the placebo-controlled trial. In addition, conducting the trials in other areas where vaccine availability will be later than the U.S. are also part of ongoing discussions. Next slide. In summary, our academic NIH and pharmaceutical scientists have brought forward a series of potentially efficacious vaccines at unprecedented speed and foresight. COVID vaccines provide the leading approach for changing societal and medical complications of the COVID-19 pandemic. And recent data on the effectiveness of the monoclonal antibodies to the spike protein provide optimism that spike-directed vaccines could be effective. Next slide. Any emergency youth authorization needs to be balanced between the good that distribution of vaccine brings and the continued need to see other platforms develop. The timing of vaccine availability for high-risk populations must be factored into the early termination decision. Is an EUA actionable? The National Academy of Medicine Framework for Equitable Allocation, which we discuss later, estimates, by my reading, nearly 30 million people in the Jumpstart 1A stage and as uh, nearly 85 million persons in the comorbidities and elderly living in congregate settings. This translates to 200 million doses of vaccine. <clears throat> when will these available is one of the key discussion items for us as a society um, to balance. Next slide. Lastly, I would like to provide thanks to the foresight and leadership that Tony Fauci played in establishing the clinical, the statistical, and the laboratory structure being used in OWS. This infrastructure derived from the longstanding commitment to HIV and influenza he has made. 
It's why we have been able to conduct such a robust clinical trial laboratory and statistical program that is the living model of the scientific process of our country's research universities. Our clinical trials infrastructure is a model to the world and making sure we maintain the scientific integrity of the programs is critical for us to continue our scientific leadership globally. Making sure regulatory staff is supported is critical to our country. We must not relax our guidelines for efficacy, and we must insist these trials be allowed to provide the scientific underpinnings of our COVID-19 vaccination strategy. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Larry. I would let, now like to introduce our next panel member, Dr. Michelle Andresik. Um, Dr. Andresik studies the social and structural factors that are associated with HIV and STI risk, and how these same factors influence the uptake of vaccines and therapeutics for these illnesses. Now, Dr. Andresik is applying these same methodologies uh, toward the implementation of a vaccine for COVID-19. Dr. Andresik, welcome. Great, thank you, Keith. Really appreciate the introduction and thanks everyone for having me. I first want to say that for those of us who have um, been involved in health inequities research, the disproportionate impact of COVID is no surprise. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that of the approximately seven and a half million COVID cases and over 200,000 deaths, the representation of Latinx, African-American, Black, Native and Indigenous peoples are incredibly disproportionately represented. Although Latinx Americans comprise 18 and a half percent of the U.S. populations, they represent almost 30% of COVID cases and 17% of deaths. For African-American and Black individuals who represent 13% of the population, they are 18% of COVID cases and 21% of deaths. And for our Native and Indigenous peoples who are representing a little over 1% of our population, almost 2% of COVID cases and 1% of deaths can be attributed to Native and Indigenous peoples. And I think it's important to recognize that the, this disproportionate impact may be underrepresented because when you look at cases, only about 53% of those cases have race and ethnicity data available. And among the deaths, only 82% have race and ethnicity data available. And this doesn't even um, include the huge impact of the loss of elders in our communities. For individuals who are age 65, they represent around 15% of COVID cases and 78% of deaths. And for those over 75, we see the representation of 57% of deaths. So the tremendous impact on communities of color um, is very, very deeply felt in our communities. And I think it's important to um, really focus on what the social and structural factors are that place these communities at disproportionate risk. And Dr. Corey mentioned some of these. I'd like to go into a bit more detail. Um, first, people of color are overrepresented in essential service industries. And these industries, by definition, place individuals at increased exposure because of more contact with individuals. One example is that only about 20% of African American workers have the privilege of working from home. More people of color are also represented in low wage jobs. And we see the impact of this, particularly with regard to household wealth where median household wealth for white families is 10 times the wealth for African Americans and 8% of that for Latinx households. And in these low wage jobs, individuals are often not provided with health insurance. Uh, among our undocumented Latino and Latina communities who um, represent large proportions of people who work in rural industries, farming, poultry, meat production. There are often no health insurance. Uh, for indigenous peoples, we often see irregular access to health services due to 
um, funding issues. And for Latinx, Black, African American, and Indigenous communities, they are largely disproportionately represented among the uninsured or underinsured. One other factor that places individuals at disproportionate risk is racial segregation. People of color are much more likely to live in residentially segregated settings with high housing density. Uh, these settings generally have poor access to healthy foods, poor access to uh, quality health care services, and individuals live in more multi-generational households with limited space. In our tribal nations, We've also witnessed um, leaders having to wage their battle against COVID across vast regions with limited resources. And Native households, I think it's important to point out on tribal reservations, are almost four times more likely to lack complete indoor plumbing as compared to other U.S. families, placing their ability to really impact um, COVID exposure um, you know, basically compromising it. And I think it's really important to underscore that because of these social and structural factors, Indigenous, Black, African American, and Latinx individuals also have disproportionately higher levels of pre existing conditions, particularly diabetes, heart disease, and HIV, all playing an important role in poor clinical outcomes for COVID 19. And finally, I just want to point out the fact that the social and structural factors that place individuals at disproportionate risk of exposure to COVID also increase levels of chronic stress and may impact an individual's ability to really um, reduce risk and exposure. So it is incredibly important that we find interventions that are effective for these communities that are most impacted. One of the things that I will never remember, my first professor, who is an African-American woman in 1987, told me that when the United States gets a cold, people of color and indigenous peoples get pneumonia. And we are now in a pandemic and we are seeing the disproportionate impact on these priority communities. And it is incredibly critical that we find interventions that work for these most impacted populations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Andesik. Uh, we'll now move on to our final panelist, who is Dr. Joseph Millam. Dr. Millam is a bioethicist at the Clinical Center Department of Bioethics and the Fogarty International Center at the National Institutes of Health. He focuses on international research ethics, and today he will speak on whether there are ethical obligations to provide an effective vaccine to trial participants. Dr. Millam. Thanks, and uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I've been asked to speak to the ethical issues that would arise in the event of one of these vaccine studies reaching an efficacy endpoint, uh, and potentially then the FDA issuing an emergency use authorization for that vaccine. Um, specifically, what ethical obligations would research groups have to provide the experimental vaccine to the participants in the placebo arm uh, of a study that's reached an efficacy endpoint? And what ethical obligations would research groups have to provide it uh, to participants in studies of other ongoing vaccine uh, candidates? Now, for reasons of time, I'm not going to give a full ethical analysis. I just want to make a couple of points about how I think we can helpfully think about this question, to think about um, Dr. Corey's elephant in the room. And I should say also that um, these are my views. They're not the views of the U.S. government. So first... Uh, I think we have an obligation to be honest and forthcoming with research participants. Uh, if new information comes to light about how to avoid COVID-19 disease, including um, the discovery of an effective vaccine, then researchers have a duty to inform participants. Second, the obligations that researchers um, and funders have 
are going to depend on whether the research groups have access to supplies of the vaccine that's shown efficacy. They'll also depend on where the trial participants are likely to get access to the vaccine outside of research studies. So to make a couple of obvious points, if one study has shown efficacy, but there's no emergency use authorization, and a second research team studying a different vaccine candidate has no way of accessing the first vaccine, they can't provide it to their trial participants. If you can't do something, then you don't have an obligation to do it. At the other extreme, if the FDA issued uh, an emergency use authorization for an experimental vaccine and the participants in your trial are likely to be able to obtain it, then you've got very strong reasons to unblend your trial and redesign it to include uh, the EUA vaccine. Why? Because participants who suspect that they're not protected may then try to get this EUA vaccine. And for safety reasons, it's going to be important for them and their doctors to know whether they've also received an experimental vaccine. And if lots of your uh, participants are going to get the um, uh, emergency use of authorized vaccine anyway, you may as well provide it in the context of a continuing study and then gather some useful comparative data. So you'll have scientific reasons then to provide it too. Okay, third, the hard cases, ethically hard cases, are going to be when participants are unlikely to get what I'll call the effective vaccine outside of a study, but the research team is in a position where they could provide it to them. So in the original study um, that reaches an efficacy endpoint, the researchers could unblind participants. They could offer the placebo arm the effective vaccine. In ongoing studies of other vaccine candidates, it might be possible to redesign them to make the effective uh, vaccine part of the comparison arm. Now, why might we think that a research team would have an ethical obligation to do this, to provide the effective vaccine? Well, it's because the new information that they have that there's a vaccine candidate that we now have good reason to think is effective. That changes the risk benefit profile of ongoing vaccine studies. We can now protect participants in a way that we could not before. And so the choice not to offer them the effective vaccine is therefore a choice to leave them at higher risk of COVID-19 disease. So how should we think about um, uh, ongoing vaccine studies in the light of this changed risk benefit profile. Well, I think that we should uh, think about it in the same way as we should any research study when we ask participants in order to create valuable information. And in any research study, the additional risks of research have to be justified by the social value of the knowledge gained, meaning the value of the knowledge for other people. And that's what Dr. Corey emphasized in his presentation. So in COVID-19 vaccine trials, we need to compare the risk participants face of infection and COVID-19 disease with and without the effective vaccine. We also need to compare the value of the knowledge gained from redesigning studies to provide an effective vaccine to the studies as originally designed. And then we ask, does the additional social value justify the additional risk to participants? And naturally, the answer to that question is going to be context specific. It's going to vary by study and it's going to vary by participant group. So the question of what's ethically owed to participants in the event of an efficacy endpoint being reached or an emergency use authorization being issued is not going to be straightforward. It's not going to be the same in all circumstances and for all vaccine candidates. Uh, it'll depend on whether participants and research teams have access to the effective vaccine. And it's going to depend on the comparative risk uh, and the comparative gain in socially valuable knowledge of changes to trial design. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Millen. We'll now begin with just a very few brief questions for each of our panelists. We could spend a lot of time asking questions, but unfortunately, fortunately, actually, we have much to come. So we're going to be brief in our questions and we're actually going to also ask our panelists to be brief in their responses. And I think I'll start actually with Dr. Andresik. 
And I'd like to ask you what so far um, with the trials that have been conducted, what has been the most effective method for ensuring diversity um, and inclusion in these studies? And have we learned things that will help us as we go forward? I think the best methods have really been reaching out into communities and disseminating materials. Um, our sites are incredibly effective at utilizing um, pre-existing relationships and um, broadening those relationships to have a further reach into communities. Uh, we are just starting our faith-based initiatives and some partnerships um, with um, tribal leaders and um, the NAACP, the National Medical Association. So really um, ensuring that we have a breadth of coverage and getting accurate information out so that communities are informed and can um, make informed decisions with regard to themselves, their families and communities and really driving people to the website. We have a website, um, www preventcovid.org and there people can sign up for the registry and sites can get in touch with them so that really has been an incredibly useful tool to connect individuals who are interested in more information and participation to the sites that are conducting the trials um, great I might direct the next question to dr. Millam um, we heard from Dr. Slowey and Dr. Corey. That there are fundamentally different approaches to to, va to vaccination for COVID, and it's very possible we can come up see a situation in which there are differential levels of efficacy and different risk profiles. So I wonder if you can speculate how one may balance the benefit to an individual receiving a vaccine versus how we actually delegate these out to populations as a whole that we heard from Dr. Andresik that may stand to benefit the most. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think um, the points that Dr. Andresik is raising about the different groups that are at greater risk for both um, uh, being infected and also for severe COVID-19 disease are really relevant to how we think about um, clinical trials. We need to have members of these groups that are more at, uh, likely to be at risk enrolled in studies in order to get information that will generalize to those groups, right? So older age groups, for example, it's really important that we know whether a vaccine is um, effective in preventing um, COVID-19 disease in those groups. At the same time, we're faced with a situation we have um, protective measures we could take. Um, those are exactly the most at risk, and therefore they're the, the um, participants who are, as it were, losing out on them if we don't provide them with an effective vaccine. There's a real balancing act to be conducted here where find the approach that minimizes the risk to participants while, as far as possible, generalizing to the different populations that we know are going to be highest priority for um, being protected when we ultimately have one or more vaccines that are effective. Thank you. And I think the last question for our panelists will go to Dr. Corey. And Dr. Corey, I was wondering if you could contrast um, the sample size for this sort of study, um, the studies, the Operation Warp Speed studies, with the sample size for more typical vaccine efficacy trials, and how does that reassure us in terms of our assessments of, of safety, immunogenicity, et cetera? Well, you know, there's whether one trial can answer everything that you want as far as safety. Uh, I mean, I, I think we um, looked at this for a number of different times with a, uh, a number of clinical trialists and statisticians and the group of statisticians that have been working on the WHO trials, as well as the ones that have been in AH and, um, uh, and in the HIV vaccine networks. Very experienced um, uh, statisticians as well as a number of statisticians in the companies. And we use 30,000. Uh, you know, if you actually calculate how many is needed for efficacy, most companies would do it around 15,000. But we fortunately have the funding uh, to be able to, um, to do larger trials. And of course, we wanted to get a quicker answer and felt that there was more veracity in, in having a 15,000. Uh, and it was also what's 
what seemed to be doable with our infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure we all, all planned that we would be trying starting one trial a month, um, um, sort of smiling at the, 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 the large infrastructure needed. So um, I think that's a reasonable, any, any um, compromise is, is, is there out of a single trial. If we do get efficacy and post-marketing surveillance um, uh, occurs, that's where um, the real unusual, you know, the, the long-term safety profile is. But, you know, a 30,000 person trial is a substantive trial with respect to um, having some indication of the vaccines, um, both local reactogenicity and long-term complications on the disease. Thank you so much. So we're now going to uh, close this session. I'd like to thank our keynote speaker and our panelists really for this excellent discussion. We've heard that these trials are carefully designed and rapidly, but very painstakingly executed really to generate the best data to support authorization, licensure, and use. It's really critical that these trials proceed as designed and without interference and that the complex decisions about emergency use authorization and licensure be carefully made in an open and transparent manner. And I'm going to turn over to Dr. Jerome for the last word. Great, thank you. I want to thank my co-host, uh, Dr. Karen, for joining me in, in this interesting session. Again, I'll also thank Dr. Scori and Dracic and Mellum for their remarks. At this point, uh, this ends our session. I thank all of our participants for listening. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, everyone. That was uh, really extraordinarily enlightening. Uh, and I think we, we saw again the importance of uh, protecting the integrity of these trials. And you heard several people, including uh, Dr. Corey uh, and Dr. Millen, refer uh, to the regulatory issues, the elephant in the room of an emergency use authorization. So that's a very natural flow <laughs> into our next panel, uh, which is going to focus on the regulatory aspects of the COVID vaccine trials. Um, it's hard to imagine really a more critical task for biomedical research uh, than ensuring that these trials are conducted with the highest standards of ethical and regulatory rigor. And the U.S. really is fortunate in having a regulatory authority, the U.S. FDA, that is a highly valued global leader in conducting impeccable reviews of new products, procedures, and vaccines, and that really has been for decades uh, a global gold standard. This panel is going to be co-chaired by Professor Kathy Newsel, who with Larry Corey is the other co-chair for the HVTN uh, and who is uh, directs the Center for Vaccine Development at our sister uh, Baltimore institution, the University of Maryland. So we're delighted uh, to have her. Uh, and Dr. Josh Sharfstein, who is now the Vice Dean for Public Health Practice at the Bloomberg School uh, and a former FDA uh, official when Margaret Hamburg was FDA Commissioner uh, under the Obama administration. We'll begin with a keynote address from Dr. Peter Marks, who is uh, current director of the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, uh, which has regulatory authority which has regulatory, <laughs> regulatory authority for these vaccines. And he will then be joined uh, for a panel discussion with both the co-chairs and with Dr. Scott Gottlieb, another former FDA commissioner from 2017 to 2019. Uh, so uh, we think this is really uh, an extraordinarily important component of the day. And we are really thrilled uh, that Dr. Marks uh, uh, and the other uh, co-chairs and, and panelists are with us uh, to talk about these critical issues. So Dr. Newsel and Dr. Sharfstein, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And I think, as you said, this panel follows nicely with the introductions by the previous moderators and speakers. As we've heard, we do face an unprecedented global pandemic, but we also face high levels of, of mistrust and confusion in the community. And while much of this stems from the characteristics of this pandemic itself, a new virus for which new evidence is emerging rapidly and necessitating constant reappraisals of, of policy and prevention guidelines, it's certainly compounded by concerns regarding lack of transparency and, and possible political interference. 
And, and while masking and, and social distancing are clearly effective, we know that complementary, durable solutions are needed. So this really creates a, a challenge for vaccine developers and regulators. A, as we want and need a safe and effective vaccine as soon as possible to combat this global health emergency, but we likewise recognize that many of these vaccine platforms are new and that we have relatively short safety follow-up and, and potentially limited data on certain populations when our pre-stated efficacy endpoints are achieved. I'm going to turn to Josh for the flip side of that paradigm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kathleen. And it's complicating these important scientific challenges is the other part of the challenge, which is confidence. Confidence for clinicians to recommend vaccine to patients, confidence for patients to roll up their sleeves, confidence for people to recruit their neighbors to get them to be vaccinated. One might imagine that in the past or under different circumstances, just the say so of FDA that a vaccine is safe and effective would be enough to give confidence, but I think we could probably agree that's not the environment we're in today. Confidence comes from trust, from credibility, and from integrity, the topic of today's event. So I'll turn to uh, Dr. Marks, who first, let me say, um, has such a, a stellar reputation and is doing an incredibly uh, important uh, job at an incredibly important moment in time. Um, we know that you, just today, FDA posted specific guidance for when the agency would consider uh, a sec safe and effective uh, vaccine for emergency use authorization even as there are stories about whether FDA would release that guidance. And so I'm um, looking forward to your remarks and hope you're able to comment on what you would say to people who are concerned about FDA's ability to maintain integrity uh, in this process. So th thanks so much for that very kind introduction. I'm, I'm really very grateful to be here today and be able to talk to you um, about this. And you've all gotten to the heart of what this is about, at least for me. And I think for the, the career staff at, at FDA who are involved in the evaluation and the approval of vaccines, which is that what we have to do, our process must end up ultimately increasing trust in vaccines. And, and because without that vaccine confidence, we're not gonna get to where we need to. Now, the truth is our regulatory mandate is uh, for quality, safety, and efficacy of vaccines. But all of that's for naught if, just as you said, people don't roll up their sleeve and take those vaccines. Uh, because without getting to the point of having a large fraction of the population vaccinated with a reasonably effective vaccine, we're gonna continue uh, to be in places like my basement right now where uh, we'll be working from home uh, for long periods of time. So we need to get back to normal lives. So what are we doing about that? Well, I think we're trying to make sure that as we consider what we do for a vaccine, that we're very clear about what is happening uh, in terms of an emergency use authorization versus how we would normally approve a vaccine, which is a biologics license application. And I think to get to the heart of what our guidance that was released today um, says the, one of the real key pieces of this, and it was already articulated in guidance that we released on June 30th, uh, 2020. But the heart of this is that the standard for a biologics license application is like the standard for other drugs, which is that we have to have substantial evidence of effectiveness um, derived from adequate and well-controlled trials uh, in order to approve something. Now, that's different from what was put in place for uh, things like emergency use authorization. For emergency use authorization, the standard deliberately was set lower because of the nature of these chemical, biologic, or radionuclear events where you might not have a chance to make things happen. And so it was, you have to just have uh, may be effective and the known and potential benefits have to outweigh the known and potential risks. So that's not really, that's not all that reassuring to many people, uh, perhaps, uh, because it doesn't sound like 
what we do for a biologics license application. And indeed, when we think about what we need for confidence with a vaccine, what we're talking about um, is that we will need to have uh, something more than just that floor for an emergency use authorization. And what that will be um, is that we'll need to see data from a large, well-designed phase three clinical trial that shows clear and compelling uh, evidence of effectiveness of that vaccine. And that's what's gonna get these vaccines over the hump. And you've already heard uh, from Dr. Corey what's being done and uh, to get there. Um, and those are the large trials that will, that will help get us there. Not only we're gonna have those data, but we're also going to vet them in a public venue. We're gonna take those data, we will look at them after they've been submitted to the agency, make sure that they meet the quality manufacturing standards that we've set, and those are articulated in that guidance, and the safety and efficacy standards. But we'll also take them to a public advisory committee meeting that will be broadcast widely um, and uh, people will be able to watch it, uh, uh, hopefully if, if it's picked up, uh, uh, we will certainly have uh, 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 opportunities uh, for people to uh, watch via web, uh, as well as make uh, the feed available. Uh, uh, so we want that to be a public enough process that people can see that this is our independent experts that are part of the advisory committee meeting can discuss that. They can discuss the pros and cons of where we stand. And at the end of the day, um, if that advisory committee recommends that we authorize something, we'll then take that back and decide what to do. Um, obviously there is a balance here because I've talked about effectiveness, but there is this question of safety. And I can't deny that we will have a narrower uh, amount of safety data than we would for a usual approval. There's no way around that. But what we do have now that we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago is these large claims-based databases and claims-based databases that are linked to the electronic medical record. So we can put together a combination of active surveillance in addition to the passive uh, vaccine surveillance reporting that we'll have as well, and hopefully make up for some of that by watching very closely for safety events. After all, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and there does have to be a little bit of balancing here. I mean, ideally, you'd like to have longer term safety follow up. But on the other hand, with close to 1000 people or more dying a day, we have to balance this out. Um, and obviously, we're not going to allow anything to proceed that we have any significant concerns for safety on. But this is this is what has to be done here in this setting. And so all of that we've articulated in the guidance. Um, we'll continue to articulate that. Um, we'll continue to try to be as, as transparent as we can about what we do, um, because ultimately, we do need to make sure that regardless of, uh, of where someone comes on the spectrum of uh, their uh, beliefs, that they can at least trust in this um, and, and feel confident that what comes through our process um, is something, because we at FDA are comfortable giving that vaccine to our families, they will feel comfortable giving it to their families. And I'll Thank stop you. there. Th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marks. One very quick follow-up, and I appreciate you're talking about both efficacy and safety. The guidance talks about two months of median follow-up time uh, for safety. Um, you know, maybe in your in your own words, you know, wh how did you, why two months? Why, wh why is that the, a, a good amount? How did you strike that balance, sort of that getting to the transparency in, in, in how this comes because you know you're vulnerable for people saying that's that's waiting too long and some people saying that's not enough time and you know how, how would you kind of explain that decision so, so that's a really great uh, question and actually there's something that's really amazing that you can actually use sometimes and that is you can sometimes actually use data 
And if you look at when most adverse events, the majority of them have occurred by, and you, you the kind of a median time, um, it's somewhere around two to three months. One could say it's a little shorter for certain events. For instance, a Guillain-Barre, perhaps it's six weeks. But for transverse myelitis, it's more like three months. Um, uh, and so we picked two months as something that was, it was reasonably aggressive, yet also somewhat, <laughs> it's kind of in the middle, not too aggressive, not too conservative, in the middle. It's possible that other regulatory authorities, and you may see this with WHO, they may choose that they'd like somewhat longer follow-up. But we feel that with the safety surveillance we have in place, that about two months is a, is a reasonable amount of follow-up as a median. Because with these very large trials, it means we will have a reasonable cohort, hopefully, of people that will be uh, more than uh, two months. Um, and obviously, it'll depend on exactly the time of the EUA submission. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Marks. And we will get back to you with some specific questions. But first, I'd like to turn to Dr. Gottlieb and, and Scott, two things really. I'd like to give you the opportunity to make a few opening remarks. And then I ask if you could very specifically comment on the role of transparency, including a, a public advisory committee in demonstrating that the process has integrity. Yeah, well, well, thanks for the um, the opportunity. You know, I'll just say um, with respect to the guidance, because it bears on the discussion around uh, transparency that was uh, included in the AdCom document saying, I'm, I'm reading on Twitter was put out um, today, but I'm not sure if that's correct. So with respect to that guidance, there, there are a few moments that I could think of where so much political dust was created by political officials for so little actual practical effect. I mean, perhaps negative effect towards whatever purpose was prescribed here. I think the bottom line is that FDA is going to stick to the objective criteria that they outlined in that guidance. The ADCOM is going to support those principles and the sponsors are going to adhere to them because the most important thing here for the drug make, from the drug maker's perspective, uh, and I think for the public health purpose, is public affirmation of the FDA role in this process. I can't imagine a circumstance where a sponsor should or would challenge or, or seek to uh, undermine the FDA's role here. We, we create objective processes in this country, we, we seek to create neutral regulators for a reason. We want certain decisions to be divorced from commercial or political considerations. Um, in this case, we want the decision around the market entry of a vaccine for COVID to be guided purely by public health considerations. So this is precisely the moment that we need an objective neutral arbiter and we need to do everything we can, all of us, I think, participating in this enterprise to affirm the institution and the process. I think the, you know, the transparency is exceedingly important because it affirms that. It basically affirms the neutrality of the agency, the rigor of the process. Um, I think understanding that these that these decisions are being looked in on by people who are expert in these in in these fields, both inside the FDA as well as among its advisory committee members, is extremely important. And I think um, people, the general public, understanding that there is a neutral arbiter here not a political actor making considerations, not a commercial actor making considerations, but a neutral arbiter that we've invested in over many decades and imbued with expertise and authority making these decisions is gonna be extremely important, ultimately getting to Peter's point um, to building public trust so that we see a high, high rate of utilization of a safe and effective vaccine, assuming we have one and we still have a ways to go. Clinical trials have not read out yet. Um, so you don't know until you know whether these vaccines are gonna work. Okay, thank you, Scott. And, and Peter, I promised you a more specific question and, and here it is. So there, there have been lots of questions and lots of media attention about the clinical hold on the AstraZeneca study. We know this could adversely affect the trials and it could adversely affect the uptake from vaccines. You know, unfortunately, information has leaked through investor calls. And so understanding it's inappropriate to share private medical information and to adjudicate specific medical diagnoses in a public forum, what is the right level of transparency for credibility about clinical holds? So 
Thanks for that question. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to any manufacturer's uh, application that's on file um, uh, when it has to do with the uh, investigation of drug application, but I can speak to all of them in general. And that is, I think we really trust that the sponsors of these trials will be as transparent as they can as part of the compact that we've entered into uh, for society right now. We are working together with the sponsors of these trials. I mean, obviously there is, there is obviously some degree of a of an adversarial relationship here. I mean, or a, a push pull because we are regulators. Okay. On the other hand, um, we are there to also be their partners to move these things along. And I think, from my perspective, um, we would encourage any manufacturer of a vaccine, any sponsor of a vaccine to be as transparent as possible about what is going on here within the um, realm of keeping the privacy of those enrolled in the trial. Um, you know, we very rarely, when we are very concerned about a sponsor not being adequately transparent, can have things like a commissioner's finding where we can make known safety information that would normally be kept uh, secret uh, under uh, an investigation of drug application. But I would really hope we don't have to get to those kind of places here because I think the real important thing here is all of us need to understand that unless we work together, industry, with government, with academia, we all have to come together to bring everyone back to understanding how incredible vaccines are. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna have to say this, just think about what vaccines have done for us. The problem is we're spoiled, right? Nobody here knows what, I don't know if anyone here would di could diagnose a case of smallpox if they sm saw it ex outside of a textbook. I mean, we are so spoiled about this. We, we don't understand, most of us who haven't worked in low and middle income countries don't know what a case of polio looks like. We don't understand what measles encephalitis looks like. Um, and that's because of vaccines. And so we have to be there um, uh, to make sure that we develop that trust once again and, and work together. So it's not just FDA, it's the whole ecosystem working together um, to help people trust what we do. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. And I think um, I definitely want to pause for a second and explore a little bit on the, the integrity in the system and how it relates to the agency versus uh, manufacturers. Because I certainly have taken the position in the past that the agency should be doing more of the communicating, not necessarily relying on the companies, because people will trust you, Dr. Marks, and um, perhaps more than they will um, a company. And if the, what we're talking about is trust, really understanding what you're thinking in a way may may be able to give that trust. And so my question is for, for Dr. Gottlieb, um, where do you think uh, industry is right now in their concern over the integrity of the process? And do you think that some of these companies might be willing to um, let uh, FDA, without doing a whole lot of rulemaking, uh, be a little bit more for forthcoming about some of these issues like the clinical hold in order to inspire more confidence in the process? Well, look, you've seen some, um, some unusual transparency that's not typical in terms of the companies releasing the protocols. And so I think that everyone's trying to lean forward here. And, and I saw one of the companies is even promising to release the data. I think you're going to see um, companies try to be very transparent around how the data gets um, put out. You, you saw the bottom line data from the phase one, phase two studies put put on preprint servers because you wanted to get it out quickly, but it wasn't just put in um, press release. There was more granularity provided. I think you're going to see um, efforts made across the board. I talked to a lot of sponsors, as you know, Josh, I think you're going to see efforts across the board to try to lean forward here um, and provide more transparency. I think everyone recognizes these are unusual circumstances and there's an unusual public health imperative. But, you know, as I said at, at the outset, I think the bottom line is that um, the more that we can um, imbue the regulatory process with integrity and, and, and recognize the regulator here as an authority, I think that's gonna be really pivotal to getting public trust around these vaccines. And so, I'd be very um, 
skeptical that anyone would uh, question, you know, sort of the regulator in this context or the regulatory standards that are being put forward, and nobody should. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is one of those moments where we have to um, really support the principles that are being put forward by FDA, and, that, and that's what I think you're going to continue to see, along with, to your point, I think a lot of transparency around the public release of information data protocols. Do you think that'll extend to cl issues like clinical holds? Well, you know, there's only one, I, I, I gather there's only one sponsor right now that you're referring to. I mean, look, I, I think I think that we should be very transparent around um, what we know around safety questions to the extent that it's, it's possible because, you know, there, there's going to be some common questions across these vaccines. And if you have any safety issues, the immediate question is going to be, is the safety issue related to the, um, the platform that's being used? or is it related to the epitope? And if it's related to the epitope, then it becomes a common issue across all the vaccines. If it's related to the platform, then it's particular to certain classes of vaccines. You know, um, understanding questions like that are, is gonna be very important. And it's gonna be important also for helping guide clinicians in what to look for in the accruing clinical trials. I mean, FDA can look and FDA will look across all the clinical trial data, but to the extent that these things are, are disclosed publicly, I think that makes clinicians in the trials more alert. And so if you think that that you know, the epitope or, or a certain platform might be leading to certain neurological side effects, you might look more closely at my, uh, you know, certain neurological side effects that typically might be um, not overlooked, but, you know, classified quickly. Um, things that are subtle side effects could be looked at more closely if there was sort of shared learnings across these trials about what we should be looking for. So I think it's important. I think it's going to get to a, a, a a qu to the extent that we're all trying to work on getting to a, a quick answer here, given the public health urgency, the transparency is going to yield that. Great, thank you. So perhaps one final question, and maybe you can both comment quickly. We only have a few minutes left. You know, this is truly a, a global effort, and many of these constructs are being tested elsewhere in the world. Um, how do you work with, with other regulators in other parts of the world to make sure that you have full access to safety data and, and that if, if signals emerge, you could detect them as early as possible. So I, I would say that, that this, one of the things that really has been uh, unprecedented in the COVID-19 outbreak has been the coming together of global regulators in sharing information, um, both in terms of our bilateral and multilateral agreements that we have, as well as in larger groups um, of regulators that come together, um, and even the largest group, which is the WHO. But this sharing has been really remarkable, whereby, uh, without getting specific, one regulator, if they see something that doesn't look right, will ask another regulator, um, and they'll make us aware of it. Uh, and we've shared information like this, and that has actually really helped us. So we are very grateful to our global regulatory colleagues. I think we will continue uh, this information sharing. Obviously, just to reassure everyone, at the end of the day, we're not going to be relying on somebody else. We're going to be making the decision based on FDA's gold standard, <laughs> essentially, or our work on looking at this. And we're not going to be relying on somebody else telling us that they thought that something was okay to approve or anything like this, because we are the regulator that actually does look at, at the data. Um, and we pride ourselves on that. That being said, this exchange of information on adverse events, on clinical trials is tremendously helpful. And I hope this actually is something that goes on past uh, this COVID time. This could be very helpful uh, into the future. Thank you. Scott, any final comments? No, I just wish my colleagues at FDA um, the best through what are difficult uh, circumstances. So it's good being with you, Peter, and good seeing you again. Okay. Thank you so much, Scott. Great. I and really appreciate it. We, re we appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb has been very supportive through this period and uh, various venues like this one, and we're very grateful for that. <laughs> thanks, Peter. Thanks a lot. Thanks so, so much to both of you for, yeah, uh, for, for coming. Thanks to everyone, and we will move on to session four. Well, thanks so much for an extraordinary panel. And I, I think it's fair to say, you know, that we've given frontline healthcare workers and providers, nurses, physicians,
uh, a lot of kudos for their heroic efforts. Well, there's heroism in regulatory integrity too. Uh, and we all really appreciate the extraordinary efforts of the, of the scientific professionals at the FDA. Our next panel will be chaired by a scientist who uh, does a lot of work with uh, getting information out through the media, Dr. Tom Inglesby uh, of Johns Hopkins, of, uh, directs our Center for Health Security. And this will be a discussion with leading journalists covering the vaccine trials and the COVID pandemic uh, more broadly. Tom will be joined by Apurva Mandavili from the New York Times, Sarah Zhang, a science reporter for The Atlantic, and Will Stone, who covers COVID for National Public Radio, NPR. Each of these journalists has written extensively on the COVID vaccine trials, and we've asked them to engage in a really important discussion around integrity in communications and reporting of science. So Tom, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Chris. It's great to be part of this really uh, critical discussion today. Let me just start by saying that I think it's pretty obvious at this point that the press has played a truly critical role in helping the world understand and navigate this pandemic. And I think in the U.S. in particular, the press has helped the public understand the science of COVID in a really strong and clear way. It's helped to separate fact from fiction. And there's been a lot of fact and sadly a lot of fiction. And the press has uncovered many things that I think would have been really hidden or obscured. When I interact with the press covering science, I think the goal for me is to present what the science shows, what public health shows, and it's not our job in science to reassure. I think it's our job to say what is factual and whether it's good news or bad news, the public can handle the facts and the public needs the facts to make good decisions for themselves and their communities. I think this is gonna be especially important with the COVID vaccine and a strong free press is essential to identifying and communicating about the COVID vaccine and to monitoring the integrity of the process as it unfolds. And certainly the Times, The Atlantic and NPR have been uh, crucial press uh, outlets uh, in keeping the public informed and engaged. And so with that, I wanna thank Apoorva, Sarah and Will for being on this panel. And I wanna start with a question to the group at a high level, what's the role of journalism in protecting the integrity of science around COVID vaccine development and science more broadly around COVID? And does the media have a different role during COVID than it usually does around reporting on scientific developments? And I'll just open it up to any of you. We'd love to hear all of your thoughts on that. Anyone want to start? Apoorva, I think you're, Mike, you're on mute. Okay, um, sorry about that. I can jump in um, and say that um, uh, one thing that you said really struck me is, you know, it's not our job to reassure. And I think that's even more true of science journalists than it is in journalists in general, than it is of scientists. Um, I think, you know, we're not there to reassure the public and we are also not there to be cheerleaders for science, which I think scientists sometimes think we are. Um, I think our job is to question and look for the truth and then present the truth even if it's ugly, even if it's full of thorns, even if it's full of caveats, to present that in as clear a way as we can to the public. Um, and if there's malfeasance, if there's bad faith science, to also talk about that. Something I hear a lot when I write about certain things is, you know, scientists writing and saying, why are you writing about this? You're going to make people mistrust science. Well, I don't think they'll mistrust science. They may mistrust scientists. Regardless, that is part of our job. And I think that part of the job um, speaks to what your, the second part of your question, which is how is how has it been different during COVID? I think, you know, it's always been the journalist's job to ask these questions, but in the past, we've been able to at least sometimes take it on faith that the things we are hearing are true, uh, especially from agencies like the CDC or the FDA. We've really been able to hear certain things and think that that more or less represents the truth. And that has been not the case during this pandemic. And that's made our job so much more challenging because now we have to question everyone and everything, including institutions that we really trusted in before. Thanks, Will or Sarah. Well, I'll just, I'll just add that uh, I, I echo everything uh, just said. And, and I think, you know, I, I consider myself a, a translator, you know, maybe a curator of information for the public. Uh, 
And, and that is how I see the journalist's role. And uh, in radio, uh, we have the luxury of, or maybe the constraints too, of time and the format, which allows us to kind of get away, cancel out a bunch of the noise and try to give people just focus on clarity. And it also is really helpful in leaving people with an impression, you know, a sense of that made sense. I trust that information and not. And in some ways that that's a benefit because we can just focus on the big picture. Um, and in other ways, it's a challenge when mm -hmm. there's so much conflicting information coming out. And I don't think that our role has fundamentally changed, but I do think of course, the, uh, the byproduct of what we do, which is creating a more informed public and transparency to the scientific process does help protect the, you know, the integrity of science, um, but it is not our, you know, our responsibility is to, is to the listeners and the readers. Great, and Sarah, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I would just agree with everything Aparva and Will said about our responsibility being to the readers first and not necessarily to the scientists. We're here to inform readers. Um, I guess to be a little bit introspective for a minute, especially because we're talking about journalism in like a public health emergency, I do sometimes think about the biases, biases that are in journalism. And by bias, I don't mean like left or right or pro or anti-science, but I think there is a bias towards novelty, right? And interesting. And so you know, where you might have, for example, this is when we started having reports of reinfections with COVID, which, which are, the evidence suggests are very rare, but they do happen. And so when you have things that um, are very rare, and when, you know, and in the context of vaccines, where we will be giving them to tens of thousands of people, hundreds, you know, millions of people, you might have events that are literally one in a million, but that's still going to be fair number of people uh, who are affected. How do you weight these really rare but maybe serious events? Um, how do you think about the context you give uh, with, like, in your story, within your, you know, your story page? And then how, how, how does that get read when it loses the context, when it travels on social media? I think those are also really important judgments that we have to make, especially in the context of vaccines. Great. Well, we've already started to go in this direction, but what do you all see as the role of journalism, role of media in addressing public concerns about potential COVID vaccine safety issues and mistrust in science around COVID more broadly. Is, does journalism have a role or what, how do you address those issues? I think, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely journalists have a role in getting the truth out there and in, in, in dispelling misinformation. I think as Sarah said, it's so important to put things into context. Um, I wrote about reinfections a couple of months ago. And one of the things I kept hearing from scientists was none of this is new. None of this is unexpected. This is exactly what you'd expect to see. This virus is nothing strange. It's behaving like everything else. And so I think it's really important to provide that context. But at the same time, as Sarah said, the numbers are just so big with this pandemic that anything that may be rare and not mm -hmm. something that we wouldn't normally worry about with a different disease or a different virus is still a huge concern. So walking that line of um, this is something you should know about, but don't panic is very difficult sometimes. Um, you know, at the times we actually have journalists dedicated to looking at what kind of disinformation is out there and very quickly putting that out. Um, we have, you know, Kevin Roos and Davey Albert, two of the reporters that come to mind who've done a fantastic job. For example, when that pandemic video went, was going around or when, you know, myths around vaccines um, crop up, they've done a really great job of you know, taking those apart. And I think there's absolutely a role for the media in doing that. Yeah, I think one of also the really important roles of the media is setting expectations. Um, you know, as, as Porva is saying, like, scientists will sometimes be like, oh, we already knew this, but like to a reader, that might, might not be true. Um, I think this is also in vaccines has been really important because uh, lots and lots of public health folks I've talked to have talked about how you're supposed to under promise and over deliver. And of course, we're living in a world which uh, our politicians are, you know, very, very much over promising on vaccines right now. So I think, and that's, I think also, you know, it's easy for us journalists to uh, be writing a story and then say like, oh, when we have a vaccine and this kind of cumulatively all creates an uh, expectation that when we have a vaccine, things will go back to normal. And I think if you talk to people who know anything about vaccines, they'll tell you, of course, it's not going to be a switch that flips. It's not going to be, it's, you know, it might not be that a vaccine is perfectly uh, effective for everyone. So I think ha uh, one of the roles we should do is not just talking about what is happening, but also what to expect. Well, yeah, I think setting expectations is is huge, and sometimes I struggle with uh, 
how to do that. Um, we're all living through this together. And, I, and my view with the misinformation is, you know, I never think it's a good idea to try to suppress um, kind of conversations that are happening um, because those conversations are going to happen regardless of whether I cover it or not. And so the way I approach those stories, um, and I, you know, I think about uh, one of the first moments I dealt with this with the hydroxychloroquine back in the spring uh, was to say, okay, people are talking about this. There are lots of claims being made. Um, how can I kind of invite people who may have questions or may have kind of believe some of those uh, those claims into the conversation. And I tried to do that by uh, actually interviewing some researchers at the University of Washington and elsewhere who were all starting these clinical trials at the time. This feels like a long time ago. Uh, and they talked about the scientific process behind that. And instead of just spending three or four minutes batting down uh, kind of false claims, I tried to pivot a bit more to what the scientists were actually doing. So that was one way I, I try to kind of approach some of these, these challenges. So you all are bringing up the really important issue of misinformation. Maybe we can talk about that a bit more. How do you all identify and report on, you started to talk about this, not only misinformation, but disinformation. We're getting some places which are actively telling non-truths about various matters in COVID and COVID science. How, what's your process for navigating that? Well, in my case, I just have to pay attention to my Twitter trolls. <laughs> it's not that difficult because they're in the, the mentions and in the emails with all of the theories. And often, actually, they give me lots of great story ideas because I see where the chatter is going and it's easy to sort of pick up on um, where the confusion is. I think because, you know, conspiracy theories thrive on the lack of information. So when I see conspiracy theories, coming up that tells me that there's a question that hasn't been answered. People are confused about something. People are afraid of something. And that's my cue to go in and ask some questions and get some answers and, you know, get the story around that. I also think that when I'm writing about disinformation or misinformation, um, the, the audience I have in mind is not necessarily the people who are spreading it. Uh, I think, you know, I have no illusions that any single article I write is going to commit change their minds. I think the evidence of like actually changing people's minds on vaccines takes kind of like a sustained and personal contact. But I think most people come at this not with sort of very set views, but maybe a lot of confusion, maybe a lot of questions. And I think that is, um, that is like the imagined audience I'm writing to when I write about this. Well, yeah, I, I would just add that, um, and I just uh, had an interesting task of calling about 50 people all over the country um, who I'd never talked to, to talk about their impressions of COVID in their community. And I heard many stories that not, things that I thought were resolved long time ago, people still think these are really big issues. Um, and I just think the best thing you can like, do. Like, but, well, like what's an example of that? What well, hydroxy, well, hydroxychloroquine, suppress medication, you know, we're, the medication isn't getting out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of these things, things about masks. Uh, and, uh, and these are people who responded to a survey. Uh, that, so from Harvard and NPR. So this isn't even, you know, these are people already a bit connected. Um, and I just, you know, my philosophy, and maybe this is partly informed by my work with radio is that you do your best to have some humanity and humility when people come at you with these um, these maybe totally you know uh, disputed ideas and try to try to find some common ground or give them a, you know do that story invite them into the story and have other people talk about it um, but I don't think we're necessarily going to change everyone's mind and I know the listeners may not overlap <laughs> you know our listeners may not be the people who actually have these views all the time. Great. And so when, when you guys are thinking about uh, the, the time ahead and reporting on the COVID vaccine development process as we get closer and more data, what, what are you most worried about? What do you think is, is going to be the hardest thing for you to cover or get to the bottom of? The fact that there are so many um, candidates out there and I, it's going to be very difficult for people to know which vaccine is good. There's a sort of this sense of competition. What will happen when the first vaccine comes out? What will that do for people's trust in it? And, and also, you know, how will we get 
enough transparency around all of those. Um, on a very practical level, I think one of the things has been just keeping up with all of the candidates. And for that, I, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Carl Zimmer, and his vaccine tracker. I think it's a pretty mm -hmm. fantastic resource to keep up with all, where all yeah. the vaccine candidates are. Um, and it gets a lot of traffic, which tells you that people are extremely interested in knowing you know, where these vaccines are. But I think with um, the level of public interest and scrutiny and fear around them, it, it's becoming very difficult, and especially with the political meddling, it's becoming you know, very difficult to figure out where the truth lies from moment to moment. I think everybody has whiplash. So stepping back enough to prevent, you know, present a clear picture to readers is going to be a big challenge. Well, or Sarah? Yeah, I also oh, worry you. I also worry about the politicization. Um, and you know, I, I think it's, it's just it's like a larger communications challenge. It's one of those issues where even the appearance of it is as bad as it actually happening, because as long as when you create any space for doubt um, in people, like they will, you know, they, they will find that doubt. So the fact that uh, everything that's already happened kind of just makes the road ahead even harder. Will? Yeah, I, I think the all the back and forth that has been happening will probably continue to happen um, does make it hard to make some kind of coherent narrative. And that is something we rely on when doing these stories is some kind of narrative. I mean, it also requires setting expectations and but people that helps people understand what's going on. And I think I'm worried people just tune out because it just seems like there's everything is all over the place. And I also know just as a storyteller, is it's harder to do stories that are very forward looking when you don't have, I mean, maybe we'll have some examples from the clinical trials, kind of human stories, but it's not as easy to build a narrative around a vaccine that it needs to roll out. And we haven't seen all the positive effects in society yet. And I think uh, that I'm trying to brainstorm how I'm going to be able to tell these stories in a compelling way when there's so much that hasn't happened yet with them. Yeah. When you guys are, are calling the agency, the science agencies to try and get updates on this or talk about some new development, first of all, do you get a response all the time? Is it easy to communicate with science agencies now? Is it harder than it used to be? And do you feel like you you get the full story or do you feel like there's withholding or what's the interaction like? You get very, very little information officially. Um, I, I don't know about Sarah and Will, but almost, you know, I've written a bunch about now, you know, things happening at the CDC and my colleagues have written about shenanigans at the FDA and so much of our, and even at the White House, you know, and, and so much of the work is really based on, you know, confidential sources, people being willing to talk at great risk to themselves and to their agencies because they want to speak up. But officially, it's, just it's not easy at all because they've all been told not to speak to the press. I know that at the CDC, for example, scientists have had their studies come out and been told they cannot talk to the press to put their own study into context. So they have to sit back and just watch other people comment on their science, maybe even get it wrong, but they're not allowed to speak. Yeah, I would say it's very different. I think the CDC, at least in the past, is always like you know, you're talking about their science and communicating about public health as a important part of the mission. And now when you officially get in touch with them, it's either silence or like, you know, past the White House. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, nothing too different here. I mean, my colleagues in DC do a lot of uh, the communication with those agencies, but when I have reached out, uh, you know, it's usually an email response, uh, acknowledgement that you've received it mostly. So, so what are you all, what are you left to do? When you wanna get, so if you can't get an answer from science agencies when you need it, what's your, where do you go? I get the unofficial version, which mm -hmm. is actually much closer to the truth. I have, you know, I ha have been lucky enough to cultivate some confidential sources, as I think you probably know, and that um, has been much more helpful than getting the official version. And the official version is often, I don't want to call it a lie, but it's often doctored, shall we say. So it's hard to actually believe it. Um, so I've had to rely a lot more on other sources of information of what's actually going on. Well, maybe I'll just ask for closing closing thoughts from you all, just for, for this audience and for the policymaking community that's interacting with the press around these really 
critical issues. Do you have any advice or suggestions for people to be useful in their interactions with you? Well, I would just say that I think it's always helpful when people don't just think of uh, scientists or as a kind of capital S, you know, monolithic. I mean, these are real people that we've been hearing working on this, um, who've invested their lives in these issues. And I find some of my, you know, most compelling kind of stories that come out have some degree of, of that reflected in them beyond just what's happening, um, kind of what their motivations are and how they view this moment after having worked on some of these issues for their whole career. So that would be my one, my one thing. Sarah. Um, well, I will. I really like that. I kind of want to echo that because um, I think we've all been living the time in our lives have been really upended and sometimes it can feel like public health people are telling us to do this, but their lives are being affected as well. And I think it's, uh, it's really helpful to know them as humans and how, you know, this is changing their lives. For example, I, I talked to one vaccine researcher who was, uh, you know, she, her home kids were kind of in the background, you know, yelling as we were having our interview. And it's, she was talking about how hard it was that she wasn't able to have her kids in school. And I think that's just like a humanizing aspect of it. Thanks. And Porter, last word. I mean, I think the policymakers that are listening, I would say, you know, you've heard how difficult it is to get the truth from public health agencies for us as journalists. So the more you can step in, you know, if there's the less the CDC and the FDA and the HHS can say, the more we really rely on the National Academies or the, you know, um, Johns Hopkins and, and ac academic experts to really step up and fill that gap. So we really need you to reach out to journalists, answer our calls, you know, make time for us. And, and uh, most of you have been, and it's great. And that's, you know, that's really what we hope for is fill that void, not just for journalists, but also for the public. Well, thank you all so much for uh, spending time with us and for all the work that you do every day. And we really all are relying on your, on the time ahead. So thank you. And uh, with that, I think that's the end of this panel. We'll turn it back to you, Chris. Well, thanks so much, Tom. And, and thanks to all, all of you, Apurva, um, uh, Sarah, and... Uh... Nope. Will, sorry for that. Um, just lost my uh, lost my screen for a moment. Um, so our last panel uh, of today looks ahead to the issues that we'll face as a country and that the whole of humanity is going to face uh, if and when we do have developed uh, and tested and approved one or more safe and effective COVID vaccines. I know we all yearn for the day when we can put this pandemic behind us, but I think many, including many of the people who you've heard from today, and I would include myself, uh, would argue that it really is highly unlikely that we're going to get there without vaccines and therapeutics. But once we have them, who will be immunized first? How will national and global allocation be adjudicated? How will health equity and social justice issues uh, affect vaccine allocation, particularly in that critical phase goes back early to the beginning of the day with Monsef's comments, when we have effective products, but supplies may be limited. And to help us think through these enormously challenging issues, we're really very fortunate indeed to have two distinguished co-chairs uh, for this last discussion. Dr. Helene Gale is one of the most prominent women in American science, and she served as co-chair for the recent National Academies Committee report on equitable allocation uh, a vaccine for the novel coronavirus that several people through the day have alluded to. Uh, Dr. Gale will be joined by the great bioethicist Ruth Baden, who's the Director Emerita of the Berman Bioethics Institute here at Johns Hopkins. And they will be joined on the panel by Dr. Nancy Bennett, who is a past chair of the U.S. Uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, um, uh, and is also a professor of medicine at the University of Rochester. Uh, Dr. Chris Murray, the director of the Institute for Health Metrics at the University of Washington. And his, he and his group have really been leading much of the modeling work that's been so influential in understanding COVID-19. Uh, and also joined by Bill Moss, who's the executive director of our International Vaccine Access uh, Center at the Bloomberg School, and really has been a leader in thinking about international uh, vaccine access research. Uh, so Helene and Ruth, the session is yours. Thanks so much, Chris, and it's wonderful to be with um, 
with uh, Ruth and the fellow panelists, um, and I think we'll have a lively discussion. Um, maybe I'll just start out by giving a little bit of the highlights of the report that, that just came out on, on Friday. Um, it is a 237-page report, so uh, in case you all don't get to read everything, it has lots of appendices as well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just maybe give some of the highlights, and I'll say, you know, this was a report that um, the CDC and the NIH asked the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to do with the idea that we didn't know when a vaccine was going to be available, but as you said, that um, it is likely that there will be scarcity and it would be important to have a framework to um, guide that. So, you know, we worked over the summer um, quickly to put together this framework using a set of um, kind of well-accepted uh, overarching principles, ethical and procedural principles like fairness, like equal regard, like um, particularly for this mitigation of health inequities um, and maximum benefit and, and other things that we thought were particularly important for uh, foundational principles, and we also put together a risk framework based on um, risk of acquiring or transmitting the infection, risk of serious illness and death, and then risk of negative impact to society, and really took as our overarching goal, how could we come up with a framework that reduced severe morbidity and mortality, negative societal impact through the transmission um, of SARS-CoV-2. So that was kind of what went into it. And, you know, I think most people um, know we came out with a four-phase framework, really trying to optimize that the risk of, of acquiring illness or severe uh, societal impact and came up with four phases as opposed to tiers where as a, thinking of tiers as more hierarchical, who should always have it first. We really looked at this more as a temporal issue of who should have it first um, and then next and then um, you know, on down the line with those at greatest risk for acquiring it, people who are on the front lines, healthcare workers, frontline workers, those who have the greatest risk of severe disease, of uh, people of all ages who have the conditions that CDC has said uh, make one most vulnerable for um, um, poor outcomes, and then any old for older person living in congregate settings. So that was where we started as the highest um, uh, priority first phase, and then worked on down that kind of risk hierarchy. I'm about to go on. Uh, worked on down that risk hierarchy. Please. Uh, with the last phase, uh, yeah, the last phase being all um, adults living in the United States, because ultimately we felt all people, sorry, all people living in the United States, because it, ultimately we felt this is a vaccine that when available, uh, anyone should have access to it. And so the phases continue on um, from highest risk to uh, ultimately the whole population, anyone re residing in the United States. Across all of those phases, we also looked at the issue of equity, because as everybody knows, this is a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted people uh, of color and people who have social vulnerabilities. So across all four of those phases, we said that geographic preference should be given to um, areas who are high on the social vulnerability index or some other index that kind of um, takes into consideration kind of the social determinants of health and the things that have made populations most vulnerable, particular populations uh, of color. We came out with, at the end, seven recommendations. Uh, the first one, that, that uh, these recommendations that our framework be adopted um, at the national level and by the state, tribal, territorial, and local health officials that will ultimately have responsibility for implementing this. Uh, we also had two recommendations that focused on implementation with a big focus on making sure that existing systems get strengthened as opposed to creating new systems and that there be no out-of-pocket costs for anyone so that costs should not be a barrier. We also had three recommendations that focused particularly on the issue of vaccine hesitancy and, and 
were recommendations around developing a national campaign, developing a database about risk and, and um, vaccine um, promotion and acceptance, and then making sure that there is a strong link to um, community-based organizations and a uh, information campaign that particularly took into consideration population where hesitancy was great and where there's a great risk of not having access to um, vaccine. And then finally, we had a recommendation focused on global um, allocation and making sure that the United States um, lived up to its global commitment, global obligation um, to be able to also think about allocation uh, of vaccine, some portion of vaccine to the rest of the world and, and recognizing our global um, obligation for fairness and justice um, and equity as we think in the global context. So that in a nutshell is what we came up with and we may get into to more of that, but I'll now turn it over to Ruth, who has also been involved in an allocation framework on the global um, stage to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll go to our panelists. Thank you, Helene, and, and thank you, Chris, for inviting us and our panelists to speak to this incredibly important issue. Uh, I know time is short, uh, but it, it does seem important to do just a few framing things, and I know uh, that Bill Moss will follow up with some more so the concept of equity in, at the global level is orders of magnitude more complicated than within country equity, as difficult as the latter is. And I do wanna say a you know, huge shout out to Helene and her colleagues. It's a phenomenal report. And I have to say that we, you know, those of us who are thinking about this, and I know Helene is always, at the global level, we're thrilled to see the recommendation that the U.S. Uh, live up to some at least um, minimal expectation uh, of obligation at the global level. The allocation questions within countries outside of wealthy countries, when you get to low and middle income countries, as everyone here I know appreciates, are constrained by what happens at the level of global equity. So as a concrete way of, of making this plain, the uh, NASM document goes to a fourth phase with the expectation that there will be a time when there will be vaccine for everyone in the US who wants to be vaccinated. That's an expectation that many countries in the world just cannot realistically have. And that is the sort of backdrop against which global equity issues are raised. Um, the principal institution that has been set up to deal with global equity issues is the COVAX facility. And I believe that Bill is going to, to speak to what that is. I won't go into that now, except to say that the US is not currently a member or participant in the COVAX facility. It is understandable that countries um, recognize and live up to uh, obligations to secure sufficient vaccine for their own uh, populations first, but that obligation does not absolve countries of obligations to at least not stand in the way of low and middle income countries having access and more affirmatively to uh, people along every living everywhere, people living in countries who cannot without assistance um, be provided COVAX, uh, COVAX, excuse me, COVID-19 vaccine. So um, it's a matter of global equity that high income countries contribute to the uh, global equity goal, but it's also a matter of national self-interest. We all know the public health concerns that uh, infectious threats to health know no borders that for all of us is canonical. And there are also clearly questions of the recovery of national economies, stable global supply chains and global markets and the regularizing of international travel will all depend on some kind of at least de minimis equitable access of COVID-19 vaccines around the world. The uh, WHO is involved in uh, several, uh, several uh, processes to address the values and equity questions in COVID-19 vaccine uh, allocation between countries and prioritization within countries. So very quickly, it's a bit of a kind of a word salad, but there is the COVAX access and allocation framework that has been uh, published and its focus is on allocation between countries of vaccine through the COVAX facility. 
Then uh, at the WHO level for prioritization within countries, there is the Sage Values Framework that was uh, released in September. That is That framework addresses both allocation between countries and prioritization within countries and includes in that framework many of the same principles as exist uh, and were articulated in the NASM report. So there is a kind of a global consensus emerging around the relevant values that should matter. And then finally, just this morning, we presented uh, to uh, a group at, at WHO what is now the SAGE roadmap, roadmap for prioritizing uses of COVID-19 vaccines in the context of limited supply. This was uh, just discussed for the first time publicly this morning, but it is a recommendation for prioritization of uses uh, with priority groups for three different epi settings and three different stages of vaccine supply within each epi setting. So I'll stop there. Uh, I don't know if there'll be time for discussion. There probably won't because we have such wonderful participants on the panel and we need to hear from them as well. So over to you, Hameen, to introduce our first colleague. Great, thanks so much. And I won't give any long introductions. People will have um, both bios and, and I will turn it over first to Dr. Bennett, um, who, uh, who is the director, well, Chris mentioned, but Senator, Director of Center for Community Health and Prevention, University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry to talk about your experience with vaccine allocation and frameworks. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I thought I'd give a little background first about the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It was established in 1964 by the Surgeon General to provide guidance to the Director of the Centers for Disease Control on the most effective vaccines and biologic products to prevent infectious diseases. It is an independent committee of immunization experts and a consumer advocate drawn from academia and public health. The committee meets in public and maintains transparency in its deliberations. The ACIP reviews the quality of evidence regarding the benefits and harms of a vaccine. This is analogous to the procedure that's done by the FDA and its advisory committee that you heard referred to earlier, VRPAC. The ACIP though goes farther. They use evidence to recommendations framework to consider the public health burden and importance of a disease, the values related to the use of a vaccine, resource requirements and feasibility. This second part of the process is really very critical to ensuring that the right people get the right vaccine at the right time. In the case of COVID, this is complicated. The committee must weigh potentially competing goals looking at safety and efficacy, of course, as the most important aspect, but then how are we going to best prevent transmission, severe disease, death? How do we minimize disruption to society and to the economy? And how do we assure, ensure equity in vaccine allocation and distribution? The ACIP COVID-19 vaccine work group meets weekly and has been reporting to extra special uh, meetings of the ACIP all summer. The work group and a vaccine safety technical subgroup are independently reviewing and presenting to the full committee safety data from phase one and two trials. When phase three trials become available, the work group will then review efficacy data and also present that to the full committee. When and if the FDA licenses or authorizes use of a vaccine, the ACIP will convene an emergency meeting to consider and vote on guidance regarding the prioritization and use of vaccine in specific groups. ACIP then forwards the recommendations to the Center, Center for Disease Control Director and uh, they are approved prior to being published and becoming policy. Of note, ACIP recommendations mandate coverage by the Vaccines for Children program and by most commercial insurers. This is an important step in ensuring equity access to vaccines. Until data become available from the phase three trials, it's hard to know what the balance, the benefit risk balance will be of different vaccines in different populations. It's also uncertain which groups will be included in licensure or authorization. 
However, the committee has proposed a draft vaccine allocation framework, similar to the National Academy framework, focused on equity and the maintenance of essential services, including healthcare. This framework will be the foundation on which the more specific recommendations based on safety and efficacy will be built. The FDA conditions of use will include to whom the vaccine may be given, while the ACIP will recommend to whom it should be given. The ACIP reviews its independent review and recommendations as critical to the safe, equitable, and efficient allocation and distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. While national guidance will be essential, the committee also acknowledges the importance of local flexibility and implementation. Finally, the ACIP will continue to monitor COVID-19 vaccine program for safety and effectiveness going forward. During this time of uncertainty and widespread skepticism of governmental agencies and policies, the independent and transparent deliberations of the ACIP are more critical than ever in restoring confidence in COVID-19 vaccine. It is essential that the committee's carefully considered recommendations form the basis of national policy for vaccine allocation and distribution. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. We'll probably get into some questions if we have time, uh, but I think that was a very useful framework of the role of the ACIP. Um, next, we'll tur turn over to Dr. Murray. Dr. Chris Murray is the Director of the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation and Chair of the Department of Health Metrics at the University of Washington. And uh, I, I believe will be talking to us about how um, scenarios and uh, actually figure into this as we think about the distribution and allocation of resource and something <clears throat> you've done um, that has been so helpful in the modeling realm. So, Dr. Murray. Thanks, Helene. Uh, so, first is context. Uh, we at IHME have been modeling the pandemic since uh, the 1st of March and uh, continue to try to produce updates of the trajectory of the pandemic, both for the US and for all countries in the world on a weekly basis. Uh, we are forecasting because we think COVID is about as seasonal as pneumonia on average, and, and that's the statistical result. So we're forecasting quite a substantial winter surge in the US and across the Northern hemisphere and it's become, many people started to ask us in our base case or our reference scenario, that's what we think is most likely going to happen. How are we capturing the potential rollout of vaccines? So right now we're rather intensively trying to incorporate vaccines or the prospect of vaccines um, into our forecast framework. And our public release runs about four months into the future and then we also make much longer term forecasts for other uh, policy users. So the issues that we've been trying to look at is first of all, the one that many have discussed uh, is supply. The best estimates from both the manufacturers, COVAX and others, is that even by the end of 2021, at, at best 20% of the world would be vaccinated, more likely a smaller number. And so then it really becomes a, a, a important issue as to who gets vaccinated. Second issue that goes into our, our pragmatic modeling of, of what the impact of vaccines is hesitancy. We know from the Facebook symptom survey that is deployed worldwide uh, that hesitancy ranges from only 30% in some countries willing to take the vaccine to 85%. The US runs around about 60%. So that certainly factors into the sort of potential pool of people who could be vaccinated. Uh, then there's the obvious issue of efficacy, which the trials will tell us, and we'll have to, you know, make a, a stab at it until the trials come out. The one that doesn't, I think, feed into some of the discussions so far is, of course, what's been the cumulative infection rate already, because the impact of vaccination, uh, if very few people are vaccinated, then it's really all about who you vaccinate. If you are getting close to herd immunity, let's say Manaus in Amazonas in Brazil, then the impact of vaccination may be enough, a small amount of vaccine may be enough to push a community through up, up to the level of herd immunity. So that 
becomes a factor in places like Ecuador or Peru or Mexico City that are over 40% uh, already infected, um, that cumulative infection factor becomes an issue. And then the one that is the most important is this issue of who, who gets vaccinated. And as you nicely said at the beginning, there's this trade-off between some fairness principles and maximum benefit. And we're trying to forecast what's likely to happen. And I think between countries, uh, it's, you know, the, the drive will be uh, towards a per capita formula for allocation because anything else really is quite challenging. So that's sort of our guess as to what might happen despite very complex issues that could actually be used. And then within countries, uh, you know, the, the at-risk groups, as you discussed, it's quite controversial right now as a last comment uh, with some uh, of the models that have come out as to whether you, if you are worried about trying to have the greatest benefit, would you be better off vaccinating those who are most likely to die or most likely to transmit? And so that, that is a bit of a contentious uh, topic and perhaps one that um, some of the modeling will give different answers and will make it even more challenging for policymakers to navigate that terrain. So I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Um, we'll move on to our last speaker, um, Dr. William Moss, who's Executive Director, International Vaccine Access Center at uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thank you, Helene. And what I'd like to do is, is very briefly uh, make a case that preserving the scientific integrity of getting to a COVID-19 vaccine is really critical to achieving global equi equity for vaccination. And in turn, achieving global equity is critical to the integrity of the whole process. I'm very briefly going to touch on uh, four topics. Um, the first is the importance of ensuring equitable access for COVID-19 vaccines. The second is the mechanism to do that through COVAX, as Ruth mentioned. The third is some current thinking about how to achieve this. And this builds on, the, on work that uh, uh, Ruth and Helene have led. And then very briefly, the, some of the challenges going forward. Um, but this is obviously a global pandemic and we need a global response. And there... There are a number of reasons why uh, we in the United States need to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. First, it's a public health imperative. Um, we cannot uh, control this pandemic unless we control it everywhere. And so the whole world needs access to COVID-19 vaccines. Second, it's a moral imperative that we contribute uh, to the, the good of, uh, of humanity uh, by uh, this achieving equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. More selfishly, it's an economic imperative as, uh, as Ruth alluded to. Um, our economies will not recover until this pandemic is uh, at least mitigated in much of the world. Um, it's perhaps even a political imperative. We're, we're seeing the vaccine perhaps used for uh, political purposes uh, as reminiscent of the Cold War era. And lastly, from a very selfish point of view, um, participating in the COVAX, and I'll describe that briefly, will help ensure people in the United States uh, safe and effective access to a vaccine. So what is the mechanism for achieving uh, global equity? Um, Ruth mentioned COVAX. So COVAX is a, is a part of a broader initiative, um, global initiative called Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, or the ACT Accelerator. This addresses vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. So COVAX is what's called the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator. There, there are three groups, that large groups, that, that lead COVAX, Gavi, uh, the Vaccine Alliance, which leads on um, procurement and delivery, uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, that leads on development and manufacturing, and the World Health Organization that leads on uh, policy and allocation. But this is really a global, a large global effort that includes governments, uh, global health organizations, manufacturers, scientists, private sector, civil society. Um, and the goal is to have 2 billion doses 
of uh, uh, one or more COVID-19 vaccines by the end of 2021. And uh, COVAX is, su is supporting nine what CEPI uh, uh, supported vaccines. So there are nine vaccines kind of within this uh, COVAX facility. Um, and the goal is to have 2 billion doses. What this does is leverage the buying power of multiple uh, economies or countries uh, that really ensures or guarantees vaccine is available, not only to the higher income uh, countries that are, that are self-financing and can pay for the vaccine, but very critically to lower and middle income countries that are less able to purchase vaccines. Currently, there are 76 higher income self-financing economies in COVAX, 92 lower and middle income countries thus 168 uh, economies that are part of this global effort to ensure equity, equitable access to vaccines. That's covering two thirds of the world's population. So in terms of uh, approaches to thinking about equitable access, and, and Ruth Faden has been critically involved in these, uh, the, the work led by Helene Gale, critical to this as well. Um, as Ruth said, there's been a, a values framework that's laid out, this is uh, under the World Health Organization, lays out six core principles to guide allocation of a vaccine, human well-being, global equity, reciprocity, equal respect, national equity, and legitimacy. Um, there's also, as Ruth mentioned, the COVAX facility allocation mechanism. This is the, uh, the proposal for getting vaccines to all countries of the world. It's done in two phases with allocation of vaccines proportional to the population size, um, uh, targeting tier one target groups, those highest risk groups, initially 3% of the population, but expanding out to 20% of the population. And then a phase two, that's a weighted allocation based on a risk assessment, which countries need the vaccine the most, that'll take the coverage above 20%. Um, there's also, as Ruth mentioned, and she just presented it this morning at the World Health Organization Strategic Advisory Group of Experts meeting, uh, a planning tool that's a prioritization road, roadmap for within country allocation. And then as Helene mentioned, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, their framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine, their last chapter, chapter eight, is ensuring equity uh, globally of a COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, Helene or uh, uh, Ruth alluded to the fact that on September 2nd of 2020, the White House announced that it would opt out of the COVAX facility. So the United States government or the United States is not participating in this global effort. Um, and the uh, National Academies uh, framework specifically recommends that the United States opt into the COVAX facility, that we deploy a proportion, uh, for example, 10% of the U.S. vaccine supply for global al allocation, and critically that we re-engage and support the World Health Organization um, in their efforts. So the challenge is going forward. As we've heard from all the panelists, there's going to be a limited vaccine supply early on, and that's going to make it very difficult to achieve equitable allocation of a vaccine. And that's why we need these, uh, these processes and need to be thinking about this now. Um, there are going to be, uh, or the other challenge is our nationalistic approaches to vaccine allocation, where countries just focus on their own populations. And there is, I understand uh, the motivation for that, but there needs to be a, a broader view uh, and uh, we need to achieve more equitable global allocation in order to really uh, get control of this pandemic. Thank you. And the, the challenge of being the last panel is that to keep things on time, um, we have to cut this short. We would love to have had more time for discussion and question and answer from our three uh, incredibly um, uh, wise, insightful panelists. But unfortunately, we've got to close this session off. So I will just turn it over to my uh, co-chair to end with any words, and then we'll turn it back to Chris. I think my words have got to be uh, have got to disappear as well because of the concern about time, which we totally appreciate. And just want to echo uh, Helene and, and extending apologies to our panelists. We had great, believe it or not, we had great questions for you. We just um, will have to ask them of you offline. And uh, thank you for participating. And I guess it's over to Chris, who will 
take us next to our two final speakers, or is that not correct? I think it's over to the Dean. Ah, Ellen, would you please sure take it away? Good afternoon. I'm Ellen McKenzie, Dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, your host for today's extraordinary symposium on the scientific integrity of the COVID vaccine trial effort. On behalf of our remarkable faculty, students, and staff, I'd like to extend a warm personal greeting from our school. Now, I'm sure, like me, you've learned a great deal today about the challenges we face in developing, testing, and using safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and why these vaccines are going to be so essential to our shared human struggle to control the COVID-19 pandemic. That effort would not be possible without the sustained scientific leadership and resources of the world's largest funder of biomedical research, the US National Institutes of Health. The NIH is a national treasure and we are truly fortunate that at this difficult time for our country and the world, the NIH is led by our final speaker, Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins has directed the NIH since 2009. He's a physician geneticist, best known for his leadership of the International Human Genome Project for the visionary All of Us Genetics Research effort, as well as his extraordinary abilities as a scientific communicator and leader. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Collins. So thanks very much, uh, Dean McKenzie, and it's a pleasure to have a chance to speak at the end of what has been a really interesting and information-laden conversation over the last three hours. It's always interesting when you get invited to summarize a meeting, you kind of figure you better show up and listen to the rest of it. Although occasionally I found myself summarizing a meeting I have not attended. It's not a pleasant experience. So I'm glad to say it was possible for me to put everything else pretty much aside this afternoon and listen to these multiple speakers in these five panels and learn quite a bit about what's going on in this uh, very important subject of vaccine developments for COVID-19. And I'm deeply engaged in that, talking to you from my home office <clears throat> where I've kind of been hanging out for the last seven months, trying to run a $42 billion a year organization and putting 100 hours a week into this effort to try to be sure we're doing everything possible on COVID-19. <clears throat> We've talked particularly about vaccines. I could give you a whole spiel about what's happening with therapeutics, but that's not been today's topic. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say, though, that despite a, a lot of the political noise, the science is really going well. In fact, it's going extremely well if you compare it to anything that we've ever tried to do before. Uh, when I uh, noticed, for instance, back in March that this was going to turn into a really major need for bringing people together and asked companies to gather with NIH and other government agencies, as well as FDA, CDC, the foundation for NIH, into something we call active, accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic interventions and vaccines, I thought that might take a matter of a few months to actually pull it off, to have that kind of a partnership developed without causing all kinds of legal issues. We did it in two weeks because everybody saw the critical need for that kind of gathering of all of the ideas around the same table. Active has played a significant role in everything we've been talking about today by its bringing those experts together. The fact that we were able to develop a harmonized protocol for vaccine trials, which is now being utilized by all the trials you heard about, uh, was a consequence of that. Of course, then that required resources to be able to see how we could run those trials rapidly and connect them up with at-risk manufacturing. So if trials were successful, you would have doses ready to go. And that's where Operation Warp Speed came into the scene. A unprecedented gathering of government agencies to work together with substantial resources from the Congress to try to do all of this in record time. And it has been record time when you look at the way in which we've gone from just knowing about this virus a little bit in January to where we are now with four phase three trials underway and two more to get started fairly shortly. I just want to be reassuring, though, about the way in which the science has been going forward. It is called warp speed, and that, I think, has turned some people off because that sounds like it might be cutting corners and taking chances. Well, it is cutting corners with bureaucracy. It's cutting corners with dead space of timetables that didn't really have to have long delays, but usually do. It is certainly not cutting corners with safety. 
you know, or efficacy. And I got to give big, a big shout out here to Peter Marks of FDA, who spoke to you in the course of the afternoon about how that is being adhered to. And let me just walk you through for anybody who still has a lingering doubt about whether the vaccines will be reviewed in a fashion that demonstrates safety and efficacy. What has to happen? First of all, you have to have a highly powered, well-designed trial. That is true of all these trials in terms of their scale, in terms of their harmonized protocol that they're utilizing. Secondly, you gotta have a DSMB, a Data and Safety Monitoring Board, that is gonna watch very closely, being the only unblinded group who can actually start to assess whether there are events and whether they are in fact beginning to show evidence of efficacy or could it be there's actually an, an, an adverse event, either a safety issue or that you have enhancement by the vaccine, which we have to look for. The DSMB in this situation is the same group for all of these trials, except for one, Pfizer is on their own track. All the other trials that are funded by Operation Warp Speed have a shared DSMB. And if you think about what was said earlier about the importance of being able to detect a rare safety problem, the fact that you can look across these trials, if for instance, it's a safety problem that might be related to the epitope, which is the spike protein, you would find that out a lot sooner with the shared DSMB than the traditional way of doing things. So the DSMB has to look at this. Then if they believe that they have seen something that might suggest that there is efficacy and good safety, they go to the company and the company then has to decide whether they are ready to submit an EUA uh, to the FDA. Notice that the company CEOs have already publicly stated they are not going to put something forward that they don't believe uh, meets those high standards. They don't wanna ruin their reputations either. Now, with FDA having made it very clear what their safety and efficacy guidance is, and if you didn't see today uh, the materials they sent out in advance uh, of the verb pack meeting, which is coming up on October 22nd, but the briefing materials were sent out today, go look at Appendix 2. That's where uh, these guidelines for safety and efficacy are very, very clearly stated. That means FDA has already let everybody know what has to be achieved in order for them to consider that EUA. But as you heard from Peter, that's not the end of it. Then they wanna have a public discussion where everybody can see what the data looks like. That group, the verb pack will then make a recommendation. FDA will decide whether to accept it. And only then uh, would we be in a circumstance where an emergency use authorization would be approved. So walking through all those steps, even though I know there's a great deal of anxiety about mischief here, it would be pretty darn hard uh, for mischief to derail this process. And I hope everybody kind of can start to get calmed down about that. Furthermore, then once we have, and I believe I'm one of those who's optimistic, we will have one or more vaccines that turn out to be safe and effective by sometime around the end of this year, maybe a little bit into January. Then I do think the distribution plan that you just heard about uh, from the National Academy panel that Helen Gale co-chaired and the way in which the ACIP from uh, the CDC will follow up on that, that you heard about uh, from Dr. Bennett. We're in a very good place to be ready for that with all of those at-risk doses that have been supported by warp speed, uh, ready to begin to be distributed. Finally, I would say, I'm really glad we had this final discussion about the last panel. We in the US have been so focused on ourselves for the most part that we haven't paid enough attention uh, to the fact that we're part of a global uh, community and that we have a moral imperative to consider that as part of any plans that we're making. And that clearly needs to be worked on uh, probably and talked about a bit more than it has so far, uh, given our tendency at the moment to look in the mirror at, at ourselves. So in summary, I would say we should be pretty confident that there is some terrific, in fact, unprecedented science going on that should give people confidence that we are doing the things necessary to try to arrive at solutions for this worst pandemic that the world has seen in more than 100 years. But all of that has been overshadowed, let's be clear, by political noise, and oh boy, there's been a lot of that, by missteps in public statements, um, by um, on people who I think unfortunately maybe wanted uh, to please something other than the truth. <laughs> and then the extreme polarization of our country, which is making this so much harder than it otherwise would be that polarization further enhanced by social media and sometimes even the mainstream media, a little poke there at our, our panel from the media because come on guys, uh, let's, let's not slip into this polarization of everything circumstance that seems to be the only way we talk about any topic these days. Putting all that aside and dealing with the fact that we have this huge problem of vaccine hesitancy that needs to be dealt. 
uh, with, I am still guardedly optimistic that come 2021, we're going to be on a path over many months. Let's not talk about this being a quick solution, but on a path uh, to where we can eventually put COVID-19 in the rearview mirror, although we will be changed by it, and I think it will be around us uh, globally for quite a long time to come. Finally, just a shout out uh, to the public servants who are making these kinds of things possible that I can talk about and say so positively. Tony Fauci, who last night was announced as the Federal Employee of the Year for the entire U.S. government. Uh, Peter Marks, who I've already mentioned, as just a wonderfully dedicated public servant. And Mansa Slawi, who working for a dollar a year, has put all of his expertise, and it is considerable, and his skill set into overseeing the warp speed effort in this, and to whom we should be grateful. They are true public servants. I'm glad to have a chance to say those few words of summary to you, and recognizing the time is already past where we were supposed to close down, I'm going to stop my comments and turn this back to Dean McKenzie. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. Um, uh, you have given us a, um, a bit of reassurance, um, which is very much needed in these times. So thank you for that. Now, I'm not a vaccinologist and I don't work in the area of infectious diseases. I am trained as a biostatistician and have spent my career in health services and outcomes research, specifically as it relates to traumatic injuries. But as a public health researcher, I have spent my career profoundly aware of the importance of scientific integrity, data integrity, and the fundamental principle that while our science does need to impact the body politic, it must be free of political interference in the conduct analysis and reporting of our work. The primacy of science must be vigorously defended and upheld by us all. And our science must be conducted in a way that benefits all segments of our society. As was talked about earlier, we must ensure diversity and inclusion in the recruitment and participation in our trials. And as a professor and now as a dean of the School of Public Health, I also know that it is vital to teach the next generation of researchers and public health practitioners the importance of scientific integrity. As a scientist, one's reputation for integrity is absolutely the coin of our realm. And as practitioners, we almost always lead with the science. Let me just add that I think we can all agree that any attempt to short circuit the current COVID-19 vaccine trials underway could truly have some terrible consequences for our country and the world. And that's why I think it's so important that we came here together to address these critical issues. So let me close um, by asking you to join me in thanking Dr. Collins, all of the extraordinary session chairs, speakers and panelists and our wonderful teams at University of Washington and John Hopkins who put together this powerful day. And thank you for your attention. And please stay tuned to this space. We have a long way to go to get a vaccine, but if we succeed in protecting the science, I'm confident we will get there and we can all look forward to a brighter future. Please stay safe and be well. Thank you.